Good evening. I'd like to call to order the February 19th meeting of the special meeting of the Committee of the Whole. Um, Councillor Bumgarner is running late due to a work commitment, but he will be here, and all other councillors are present. Calendar and communications. Councillor Parker. I attended the Health and Wellness Expo for Black History Month in New London that was put on by the LECTA, Chapter Number 7, Order of Eastern Star, Sweet Potato Society, Inc., and the Jephthah Lodge Number 11. I also attended the Circa at Avery Point, um, attend, um, volunteered at Friday Night Out, and attended the panel discussion that was held at St. John's Church uh, by the NAACP uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Councilor Franco. I attended the Economic Development Com uh, Committee meeting, the Mystic Cheese Grand Opening, a Fitch Baseball fundraiser, and a Thayer Mahan tour that was open to all counselors. Councilor Excellent. Uh, I also attended the Thayer Mahan tour. It was fantastic. Um, had the pleasure of hiking Gunji Womp with a tour guide from the Denison Pequot Museum. And actually, Mark Ofinger was on the tour, so I, I got to uh, you know, reminisce with the former town manager. It was great. Um, went on to um, a fundraiser for one of our RTM members, Portia Bordelon. Um, and then what was the most recent thing today? Uh, per, uh, I was on the Personnel and Appointments Committee meeting with uh, Councillor Schmidt and Councillor Zapiri. And we ended up recommending to the mayor, which you'll get the minutes, to recommend um, Nancy Codian and Ann Orkney to the Beautification Committee. Uh, and then Stephen Scott Pierce also uh, was applying, but he would like to be a liaison, so he doesn't want to be a full member. He opted to be a li liaison for the Parks and Rec Committee to the Beautification Committee. Very good. Councilor Ober. Um, <laughs> what have I done? Thank Lord you. only knows. I went to a two-day conference with the Connecticut Association of Realtors or, that was held right here in, uh, in Groton and had the pleasure of a presentation, of course I can't remember his name, of the gentleman that wrote The Perfect Storm. And uh, it was quite a two days. Uh, I attended the uh, SCAR meeting, the Regional Recycling Association. Or I also attended the Re Retirement Board quarterly meeting that was held last Thursday. And I went to uh, CIRCA, the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation. And I went on the uh, Thayer Mahan tour in, on Leonard Drive in Groton and was very impressive to know how many uh, different types of companies we have with such intricate businesses. It was, it was very enlightening. I was away for a week and a half on a vacation, which I enjoyed <laughs> thoroughly. And I got back, today is my first day back. We got back yesterday afternoon. In any case, I opened my email and discovered that I had an email from uh, Carolyn Wilson from the Ledge Light Health District. And she had contacted Rachel before she told me. And she's interested in seeing the town of Groton and, uh, get involved with Tobacco 21 movement. Um, currently, the minimum age for which uh, tobacco sales are legal is 18. By raising it to 21, we can reduce the number of active smokers by a very significant percentage. In fact, if you could raise it to 24, supposedly there would be no adult smokers in the country after a while. But uh, uh, there is a movement, uh, and, uh, and, and we ought to look at passing a, um, a uh, ordinance in Groton to uh, make the uh, minimum legal age for cigarette or tobacco sales 21. Uh, Hartford has already done it. Bridgeport has already done it. Uh, towns in Massachusetts have done it several years ago and have reported major decreases. Needham, uh, Massachusetts, and some of the surrounding towns, major decreases in the number of people smoking afterwards. We don't have to go over all over again the, the billions of dollars in, in health care costs that arise from the habitual smoking of, of people in the country. Billions of dollars 
when you record health care uh, or health diseases in terms of the dollars spent on them, you really don't give a, an impression of the amount of human suffering that is involved. And I think uh, as time goes on, we'll, I'll, I'll be bringing this up again. I'll be working with Carolyn, and I'll bring up again uh, a, a hope that all of you will join me in raising the minimum legal age for cigarette sales in Groton to 21. Thank you. Oh, busy week. Um, I attended the Fair Mahant tour as well, uh, Leonard Drive, which is turning into quite the place. That's where the Mystic Cheese store is opening as well, next to Beard Brewing. Um, we attended a meeting at um, Stonington Police Station with Lieutenant Governor Bicewitz, where she invited um, Stonington, Stonington Borough, Groton Town, Groton City to meet with her to discuss our concerns and um, it was kind of a listening tour for her. Attended the Circa meeting um, with some members of our community that had served on a sustainability committee in 2011 um, and met with the people there and they were very informative and helpful in guiding us in some direction. I'll be making a referral later this evening. I just wanted to thank the Groton Animal Foundation. They've donated over $12,000 to help take care of the animals at the um, Groton Animal Shelter. So thank you to Groton Animal Foundation. And I believe that's about it. Mr. Burt, did you have any communications? No, I went to some of those same meetings, the Thayer Mahan tour, which was excellent, the Circa meeting, which gave me a lot to think about. and. Uh, the retirement board and the lieutenant governor meeting. Right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Approval of the minutes. Councilor Franco, this is page two for the minutes, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilor Parker. <laughs> I make a motion to approve the committee of the whole minutes of January 22nd, 2019. I see. Moved by Parker, seconded by Franca. Any discussion on the minutes, which begin um, in earnest on page three? Sure. Councilor's prayer? On page 10. Uh, it, it begins on page uh, nine. Uh, uh, it was a motion to suspend the rules and uh, uh, recommend uh, to move forward on House Bill 5765. Uh, and then there was, uh, the, actually that what I'm talking about is related to uh, the uh, motion to uh, uh, become sister cities with uh, Kingston, Jamaica and Haifa, Israel. Mm -hmm. And that, that was recorded, the vote on that was uh, 630. But for some reason, the method of recording was different than we usually do. We usually indicate which uh, counselors voted which way or abstained. And I think that, I don't know why we slipped away from that in this, but I, I think that's an error. So you would like the um, recording of the vote to explain the three counselors who were opposed? I'd like it to show who was opposed and who was, I don't think they should be handled any differently than we've handled all the other votes that uh, appear in a box form, so identifying like the, the individuals uh, who voted which way. So you would like um, the person recording the minutes to insert a chart here with the vote? Yes. Okay, very good. I can make a note of that. I'm assuming that the three are the names after that. I, that's what I would assume as well, but I understand yes, what he's uh, speaking uh, of. It uh, seems like consistency. It would be yeah. nice to have it in yeah. the same format. Anything else on the minutes? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of approval of the minutes say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? So moved unanimously. We are at eight counselors as Councilor Baumgartner um, is not here as to a work commitment. We are on to item five, and we are on 5A, 2019-101 Merit Quit Claim Deed, and this is on page 11, and this is Councilor Franco. So, 
the TIF master plan that's already on right now. Merrick Quick Plan, page 11. Um, you must have the minutes from last week. Yeah. So go to the third item. Look at your look at your agenda, and I think it's the item immediately following the TIF master plan. I don't think I brought the old minute, the old schedule. If you have a question, Conrad, to read if you'd like. Conrad, um, Councilor Heed, would you like sure. to read? Um, um, I make a please. motion to recommend a resolution approving town manager John Burt to execute the quick claim deed prepared by the town attorney and file such deed. Second. second. Moved by Heed and seconded by Parker. Mr. Burt, did you just want to brief us on, um, or brief the public on what this is, please? Uh, sure, I've got Gary here if there's any real questions. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, just that they, you have to, uh, ex I mean, all things you, you have to execute. Is it to combine them together, Gary? Right. You have the two parcels in order to build on it to get the permit, you have to combine them together. So it's just a matter of procedure to do that if we want to have a school. Oh. So, so my concern <laughs> is um, given all the things we had to clean up on the way items were handled in the past, um, is there anything exceedingly restrictive in the deed language for are the numbers and addresses all correct? I understand there was some concern in the past that we had. So is everything good proofread by like nine you people? You guarantee it, Gary? Guaranteed, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> correct. The uh, town attorney has reviewed it. Excellent. And can, can you wait one, one minute, please? Thank you. <laughs> we wanna make sure everybody can hear, <laughs> hear your comments. This is Mr. Schneider, Public Works Director. Uh, I don't know if I'll guarantee it, but uh, Three people have reviewed it, the town attorney. We sent this, over, sent this over to the town attorney with all the information, and so he's taken a, not a quick look at it, but he took his uh, time and his due diligence. Rick Norris and then myself and, a, and the town engineer looked at it too. So this is, the pin numbers are right, the addresses are correct. We went around the map with all the, the meets and bounds. So th this is it. Thank you, I appreciate that. Any other questions or comments on this particular item? <coughs> Councilor Atwater. I have a comment. I thought it was interesting that we have two alternatives. One to approve it to execute quickly indeed, and the other to not authorize the town manager, and then it says the project to construct the Grotten Middle School will stop. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't want to do that. I guess not. So. It's getting tough. All right, all right. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, all those in favor of 2019-101 Merit Quick Claim D, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? So moved unanimously. We're on to 5B, 2019-106 Pavement Management Annual Report on page 16. Councilor Obrey. Mm -hmm. And there's no, no formal action required, just looking for a consensus from us. Here on the road maintenance. Mm -hmm. The road maintenance and rehabilitation program requires each subdivision, town, city, and Grot Long Point to report to the town council each year the results of that year's work and identify the next set of roads to be completed with the road bond funds. It also <laughs> requires each to present to the town's finance director the corresponding cash flows that will be required to complete the roads for 2019. I so move. Okay, it doesn't require oh, it doesn't a formal, require a formal resolution, but that's okay. fine. Thank you very much for reading and introducing so the public's aware of what we're doing. So Mr. Schneider is here. Uh, yes, I also have Groton Long Point, and I do believe the city of Groton is here. So uh, I can start out with the, with the report. Yes, please. Madam okay. Uh, in your packet uh, should be about a six page document, and this uh, out outline uh, what we have done uh, previously uh, to date. Uh, page three, uh, excuse me, if I, if I go back to page two. Uh, in the center there is what we had done in this current or last calendar year. These go by calendar years. We did High Street Mystic from Route 1 to Star Street. We did a short portion, short, short portion, 
of Governor's Circle, just off of Route 117. Of course, we did Thomas Road, and we resurfaced uh, three of the roads uh, for Groton Long Point using uh, their funds. For the year that we're in now, the calendar year that we're in now, we are proposing to do North Stonington Road, which is a small section of road up by Route, 1, uh, by Route 27 in the northeast section of town. Shuvel Road, which has always been on the Schedule 2, that was be from Route 184 down to Route uh, 27. Pumpkin Hill Road, it's a road that uh, really needs to be done. And those will be done with the full, um, the full depth reclaiming of these roads. And Buddington Road, but Buddington Road will be doing a milling operation where we just remove the top two inches of pavement, uh, tack coat, and put on a new surface down. Then uh, what we had looked out and for the future is that years 2020 and 2021, those are the remaining roads that we have to do. And those roads have been estimated to use up the total uh, allocation for the town, which is about $1.8 million. Some of the uh, highlights of, of, of our paving program for the town here is that uh, we are not ahead of, but we are following the gas and the water installation in the Mystic area. High Street, uh, before we had resurfaced it, uh, 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 Quarry and Water Company came in and replaced the water mains in that section. Of course, uh, Eversource is putting a large gas main installation down in the Mystic area. That's why we've pushed off some of the roads in the Capstan, Irving Street, Island View, Windwood Lane off to follow their installation of the main, their gas main in the road, and as many laterals to the houses as they can get you know, signed up for people on, on it. What that does is that lets us then resurface a road. There's not a scar down the middle of the road or on the edge. And then for 2021, those are some of the, the, the remaining roads that we have have to do in the area. And again, we are following the water main installation that will be done uh, by Aquarian on High Street and in the New London Road area. Uh, so on, on page three, it goes from when we first started the project of all the roads that were done. Uh, there, uh, page four uh, on paragraph two highlights some of the um, additional roads that were added to the original uh, uh, list of roads uh, that we have with the same funding. We didn't ask for any additional funding. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the third paragraph shows the remaining funds to be expended of $1.8 million that will cover our uh, three years that I proposed, 19, 20, and 21. Uh, it goes, um, uh, paragraph four is that we are using the most up-to-date current mix for resurfacing, which is what they call super pave. So we're following the state specifications on that. Uh, we have, uh, uh, since uh, 1990, we have kept track of all the roads uh, uh, resurfacing in the town. And uh, uh, that if, if, if there's anything, uh, we, should be, uh, we should be resurfacing our roads uh, on, on, on a lesser of a time schedule than once every 20 years. That's what we're roughly uh, moving, moving through our system right now. Uh, we are, as we, uh, as, you, um, as we resurface each of the roads, we look at the, the width of the road. And if we can, we'll narrow the road down to the current standards. Since, the, uh, since 2002, when we were keeping track of this, we reduce uh, pavement by 7.4 acres of paved surfaces. So what we're doing is the areas that after years of road creep, well, we narrowed the roads down. We took our little bump outs that were, wasn't required. If the cul-de-sacs could be narrowed, we, we did that. And that saved us about over half a million dollars in, uh, in, in, in paving. Um, and that's what 19, uh, 2016 costs projected out. So, um, and we, we, we will continue that with the remaining roads that we have where we can. We'll narrow them down to the minimum width, savings in asphalt, and of course that's good for stormwater. Uh, so that's the, uh, the projects that we had. Uh, that's projects that we, that we intend to do. Excuse me, we intend to do this fiscal year. Uh, the program is still moving along. I think it's a real good program that we have here. We have a, a good rapport of working with Grot Long Point doing their roads. Um, so that's my report. Thank you. Does the council want to hear from um, all of the people here to talk on public works, or did you want to talk to Mr. Schneider first and then move on to the next area? Do you have a preference? Why don't we go one at a time? Okay, so just let everybody speak and then. Um, ask the question. Okay, the so do you have questions for Mr. Schneider? I have one. 
Councillor Obrey. Um, my question was, uh, I'm just glancing at this, I had read it before, but um, I was just wondering, we, I've had a few uh, different people that had contacted me about River Road. Do we have that a program for any time, or have we done anything to it already? Uh, years ago, we had addressed, we had resurfaced the roads. It's, uh, I can't tell you what year, but it's, it's, it's been over 10 years that we have. We are addressing certain sections of the road, you know, for uh, potholes. Uh, we'll do that, but it's not on the resurfacing list. That would be on the next uh, a series of roads that the council will need to fund. So the, with the current funding we have right now, it is not on any list. Um, how about some of the savings that we had? You mentioned that we had some savings. Uh, those, uh, those savings that we did have uh, uh, let, us, let us resurface those roads that, uh, that, I, ha that I had mentioned uh, that we added to uh, in the project. Uh, so there really is anything, and that's always on page four uh, to uh, uh, paragraph two, which was the, the, so those savings uh, let us um, pay Briar Hill Road, Watrous, Reitman, Hillside, a portion of Pearl Street, Noank, where we had to do the sidewalk. And then Thomas Road wasn't programmed into the, into the mix either. That was authorized by the town council to use the existing funds. That had its own money, didn't it, Thomas Road? Uh, it, we used uh, uh, the recommendation from the, uh, for, from the uh, department here and the council concurred was to use the road pavement funds. There were funds there. They went back into the capital reserve fund. Uh, <clears throat> so if the funds that we did not use, went, it was if there was a capital project, they went back into the capital and, and reserve fund. Councilor um, Mr. Burt wanted to jump in for a quick second. We'll come right no. back. No. I just wanted to mention at River Road, we, we check that out pretty regularly. Um, and I think it was estimated about 700,000 ish to do. And right. that wouldn't address some flooding issues that occur in that road. And it's just not as bad a shape as some of the other roads we have, uh, at least visually. But once we, we're going to do a CIP for a new pavement study, and that pavement study will tell us, you know, are we in fact right visually or not. But. Um, it, it's not the right time yet to do River Road. There's other ones ahead of it. But the payment study should tell us more. Councilor Overy, did you want to add any other questions? Well, I, I think the thing that bothers me about it is um, it's, uh, I never go on that road, but I see people on that road, either riding bikes, walking, running, and it's, it's not really safe for any of that because it's a narrow road. So I think it. Uh, I will go with your your review of it. Um, I'm not sure we would be in that 700,000. You won't be widening it either. You'd probably have to have land equity. It becomes a much bigger project if you want to look at widening it. Yeah. It becomes. Yeah. I I don't know exactly mm -hmm. what I. You know, I'm not the expert, but I I do think it should be something that needs to be considered and right. maybe. We're just talking pavement condition at this point. We've only had one person complain about the pavement condition. I've had actually several people call me, so I don't know if I'm special. We've only had one. <laughs> okay, we have Councilor um, Zapari, Heed, and then Schmidt. Um, I, I, I told everyone I just got back from vacation, so I didn't have time to work on this uh, before now. Uh, today I called Betsy and asked her if she could get us uh, get me a copy of the uh, the uh, budget hearings that we had uh, last winter. Uh, there was a list of in that that those hearings that you presented a list of roads that were going to be done this year. Have you done all the roads that you had proposed doing when you came to see us last winter? Uh, yes. They're all, they're, they've all been completed? Correct. Okay. Uh, that's what I wanted to know. Thanks. Councilor Heed, Schmidt, and then Franco. A uh, question, but before that, I guess just a thought. I've, I've been on River Road as well, as, and there are a lot of pedestrian uh, travelers. I, I wonder if in the future that might be, you know, we contact neighbors and we ask if they'd be interested in a one-way road or if there's another way that you could have <coughs> pedestrians off on the side because I know it's limited by the rock walls and the trees. I don't think you, you can widen it. Uh, but my question would be, um, when we choose roads, how do we go about, I mean, 30,000 
foot level? How do you go about determining what roads need to be done, what, which ones can wait on you know, your priority list? That priority list was, was, uh, came from a MAC, a MAC tech report, which was a uh, pavement uh, engineering firm that took a look at all the towns using a micro paver, which is the Army Corps of Engineers way of uh, analyzing all of their pavements that they have on military bases and airfields and everything else. What it does is uh, it, it takes a look at sections of the road. It, it divides a large road up into sections. And the sections then there are uh, certain areas that they'll inspect to a given picture that they have. Alligator cracking, maybe a four, a crack, maybe a three. So, that, so they analyze each section of the roads. So they run it through a, a program and it comes out with a pavement index for the roads. So what we had proposed at that time was using from the MAC tech report is looking at the worst roads that we had. And the worst roads is the roads that would benefit the best from a resurfacing. There are certain roads that we're just going to let die because you don't want to put it. If the roof is rotten, you don't want to put another set of shingles on a rotten roof because it'll look nice and it'll still be a rotten roof. So there are certain roads that we did take off, but that was done uh, in the beginning. Uh, when we had the report, then we came to the council, uh, uh, and that was before the bond referendum was put out as part of the public hearing. We listed the roads and that would be addressed. And then they were addressed in, in, a, in a logical order where we, we could work in neighborhoods. So if we had a list of roads, we wanted to work in one neighborhood, not, not to bring machinery around. Second, if we could stay behind the utility uh, uh, work <coughs> that uh, was being proposed for the area, we would be behind it, not in front of them. Uh, that hasn't happened all the time for this uh, and, and the last uh, set of roads that we resurfaced here. But it came from that, that MAC tech report that analyzed the roads and then we, and then we just put it through a cycle of uh, something logical uh, to address. So that's what we're working off, the list we're working off now. Thanks. Councillor Schmidt and then Franco. Um, and I was concerned about the proposed um, uh, replacement of water mains by the water company mm -hmm. in Mystic. And certainly that's going to be a big upheaval of those streets. Those roads will never be really well passable again because we know what happens after everything is torn up and then patched, that it makes it very difficult. Are we taking that into consideration or is the water company working with the town on those particular projects? The water company is working with the town. The, their engineers met with us twice, and, and, and uh, with us, me, uh, myself, and the, and the town engineer, they have met once with the town manager to, to look at the whole situation. We'll have an inspector out there, not all the time, but uh, they know our standards for, for the replacement and the repair. There will be a temporary patch put on the, on the main itself, on the trench itself, until it settles, but they'll have to come back and then do a permanent repair. The repairs that we're looking at is what the gas company has done on West Mystic Avenue. Uh, that's a good example of, of, of a repair there. It's the type of repairs that we have done when the town was in, in the process of putting uh, sanitary sewers throughout the neighborhoods. It's the same type of road patch. So there will be a scar, there will be a patch on the road, but we'll be out there watching. They know our standards. They know of the issues that we had with some of the gas main installation during the first phase. Of, of work, uh, so they are cognizant of what we are, uh, what we need, what we want, what we will require of them. Uh, so I'm, I'm confident right now that all the upfront work is done. Will there be some interruptions? Absolutely, with traffic uh, and, and with the work that's been done in the area. But uh, after it is all done, there will be a scar on the road, but it will be look more like uh, what is done on West Mystic Avenue, uh, which is a nice, good patch. It's stable. Uh, and, and even if that patch does fail, they need to come, they will come back and, and, and fix it. That's part of the requirement. Right. Evidently, the patching that was done on uh, Judson Avenue and Judson Street uh, was deplorable. That, that was temporary patch. Uh, we, we knew that. We worked with them because uh, it was coming in late in the year. They also wanted to get the laterals in. We could have required them to do a permanent patch. Uh, on, on that road, and then they would have been cutting into it each time to put a, a house lateral in uh, and, a, and a gas main lateral to the house. So we did understand it. They did come back and do some temporary patching, but that's just a, that's just a temporary patch on, on Judson. Uh, uh, there's several other roads that they've just put a temporary patch in. Uh, Roland is another one where there's a temporary patch in, uh, but they are coming back. Once the plants start opening in spring, uh, they will then start some of the permanent 
permanent work uh, in, in those areas that they feel that there's no there's going to be no more gas sa gas line sales in those areas hooking houses up. So that was a temporary patch. That's not what it's going to look like. But that temporary patch does uh, encompass several months, not just a short period of time. Uh, and so it's very difficult for people living on that street. Uh, absolutely, we understand it. It is still passable. It is still safe. It doesn't look right. There's a temporary patch on Irving Street that looks better than Irving Street, but that's on our list of things to do. Uh, I've been here since 1983 when we were going through a sewering project throughout the, the area, and that was, that was rough. Uh, because of what we had to do to get a sewer down on the road. There was temporary patches, there was in some inconvenience to the neighborhoods, but all in all, when the project was done, the road was put back in a, in a not in, put back in more than just a serviceable um, condition. Thank you. Councilor Franco. Um, for full disclosure, I live on Topsail Lane off of Judson Avenue. Um, I don't see Judson Avenue on the list. Is that? Correct. That was done several years ago as a separate project, so it, it wasn't on that. It wasn't on the bond referendum list, so that will get a permanent patch. But top sale never did get done, so that was that's top sale is going to get resurfaced. All right, top sale is in both the 2020 and the 2021 list. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was that was me. I was I was stuttering. It should be in 2021. Okay. I I just saw that. So. Um, I, some people have been con in contact with me, and they had asked if Public Works could do the road review themselves. Are you, is that something you're capable of doing? Uh, we, do, we, we don't have the staff or the expertise. Uh, it's having a firm that does this for a living. Uh, and there's several firms out there that do it now. Instead of, uh, there's one firm that actually, like Google, will go down the road with sensors and cameras and do it and uh, to take a look at everything. It gives a real um, objective review of it that doesn't have any biases in it. It's the condition of the road. Uh, so uh, it's, we're not capable of doing that. All right, so when West Mystic Avenue was, so that they're not going to do any piping on that road anymore? They're completely finished with that? I do believe all of the laterals to the, so the houses are in. And I, I know they patched the, the, the main line on there, but I do believe all the laterals to the houses were in. If they have to cut another one, they have to do a permanent patch on the road. But they wanted to get that road done by the end of fall because it's a ser fairly heavily traveled road. Uh, so, they, so they did that, and they, they pushed their salespeople to get, get as many of the services in as possible. Right. Just because I live in the neighborhood and I hear my neighbors talking about this, and one of their concerns was why was West Mystic done so nicely? and even though roads in that neighborhood were done first, like, you know, down, um, let's just say Irving and Capstone were done first, why weren't they like West Mystic? Oh, Irving Street, as you see on our schedule on page three, Irving Street will, is programmed for 2020, not this year, next year. Uh, they'll give them the chance to get the water main in, and then the whole road will get done. Uh, but what, what it was was a, a number of, uh, West Mystic takes a fair, a large amount of traffic, whereas Roland and some of the side streets do not. Um, so that was one of the factors they put in. It was also done at the end of the, it was close to the end of the year. The asphalt plants closed in November, so that was part of the, the issue too, is making sure things were temporarily patched. But they didn't want to get too far, too late in the fall to do a permanent patch because it just doesn't come out right. All right, and um, one more thing. If, so the patching is not by Public Works, to make that perfectly clear, it's by Eversource. They're the ones Correct. taking care of this. Um, and if, as I had noticed, some of their patchwork has sunk, and then you end up with big divots. And um, who would they contact for that? They, they can contact us, the, the Department of Public Works. If you just call our main number or email us, we, we, we have the direct line to Eversource uh, and the contractor, which is RH White, and that they'll come out there. And if, and if it is a really a large divot, if it's just a little depression, uh, that would be something that we can live with. But if it is a divot in that, we'll, we'll have them come in and patch it. If it is really a concern, I will go out there with our crews, with our, with our temporary patch. We'll patch it and then back charge. So if it's something, if they're not responding, we just don't sit there and keep calling them. We, we will then do it and back charge them. But we haven't had that problem yet. Okay. Thank you. 
I just had a question. You were talking about the MACTEC study that was done quite a while ago. Correct. If um, it was the choice of the council to have another study similar to that done, um, can you give us a ballpark what that would cost? Three, Please. I do believe two or three years ago when uh, Mark was the uh, uh, town manager, we, we had went through a cycle and I do believe for MACTEC to do it was about $85,000 to update the three that would be Grout Long Point City and the town. There's another firm out there that does it more visually, almost like Google. Uh, what we would do is we would go out and uh, get a pricing on who could do what and, 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 and how much, but we're looking between fifty to eighty thousand dollars. And your your judgment at this time was uh, eighty-five thousand would be better spent fixing roads. The for, at least for the I, I can only speak for the town for for the town study that 2008 report does have all the roads in it and it has an aging uh, uh, chart in it itself and it's just a straight line in depreciation. One of the factors is just using that chart and pick off the next 10, 15, 20 roads, whatever we have money for, and just start working down that list. There's some. Uh, other factors in there. If there's a private development going in, then you should hold off on it. If there's a utility, going to do some utility work, we hold off on that. If it's a road uh, that has a lower PCI that has less traffic on it than a, another road that has more traffic on it, you move things around a little bit. Uh, you just don't take what the numbers are. But one of the items is that we can use that existing report because there is an aging uh, 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 spreadsheet in there and just start going down, uh, picking them off. So that's been, even though it, it has been a while since that study was done, it's still useful to the town to rely upon? It, it's, it's still a useful document. Uh, what it doesn't take into account of all the roads that we've done, it doesn't factor those roads in there. I mean, we, we, we could again, but I don't think we're going to be looking at doing drastic drive. We just did that several years ago for Briar Hill Road in the next 10 or 15 years. Thank you. Um, Councilor Parker at water before we take second time comments. Councilor Sapir. Oh. Uh, how many how many roads do we have that you have to take care of in the town of Brown? Mileage wise, mileage wise is about ninety five miles of roads, center line. Uh, ninety five miles, uh, but you seem to have divided up the the operations by street names. How many streets are there? I, I, we have that information that's, I don't have that with me, and I have to count them. Okay. How many miles are you doing each year? Doing about five to six miles on a, on a good year each year. So that, that does allow, allow for about a 20 year rotation? Correct, a, a little longer than that, yeah. correct. And yeah. asphalt wears out quicker than that. Yeah, yeah. So you, need, you want to increase the numbers that you're doing on an annual basis by about 30%. 33%. You, you could, if, if you want to get on, 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 on a cycle of you, 15 a, a resurfacing, which could be a milling or full depth reclamation every 10 years, a cycle, and then you crack seal, you, you patch and everything else in between. It, it, that, that'd be in the best case, mm -hmm. but I don't, you know, it's, it's, you know, do we paint our houses every five years? No, uh, the roof gets every place every 20 years, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Or then it becomes 25 and then 30 years when you get a leak. Yeah. So to plan for that would be great, but I don't see any town doing it. I don't even see the state of Connecticut running through that cycle. Yeah. So wh what do you hope to get to? Do you want to stay at 20-year tw cycle? or if, if we would stay with that, I think it's livable right now on, on, a, on, a, on, a, excuse me, on a portion. Because okay. some of the roads out there we haven't even touched in 20 years. Okay. Mr. Burt, did you want to add any comments at this time? No. Okay, if no one else has comments, then we can go to the next gentleman. If you could just use the microphone, please, and just uh, state your name for the public, please. Thank you. Steve Panikoff, Director of Public Works at Groton Long Point Association. In the spring of 2018, the uh, town of Groton and the Gary's uh, supervision paid the following three roads. They were Pacific Street, Cross Street, and Clubhouse Point. I'd like to emphasize uh, the supervision and professionalism of Gary and his supervisors, Steve Post and Dave Phillips, enabled this project to be completed 
without problems and on time. The roads are smooth, level, no snow or puddling rain happens. And from my observation in the last four years working with Gary and the crew of people that he has doing this, it's a real team. And I think the town and Groton is very fortunate to have Gary and the caliber of public works employees that they, we do have because you don't get have to deal with callbacks. Residents stop, ask questions, they're treated very politely, and all precautions are taken for safety. And the project gets done and on time, which I can't say for all contractors, but the town of Groton is way up there. Next year, if there uh, maintenance and rehabilitation of roads would be Tautauk Street, South Shore, and Island Circle, North and South. If the town should be investigating in the future a, another five-year road bond project, Groton Long Point would definitely be interested should you go in that direction in the future. I'm open for any questions if you have. Thank you, Mr. Panikoff. Anyone have questions? For Groton Long Point's representative, Mr. Councilor. I, I, I just com comment. Your comments are most appreciated by me. Uh, your experience with our with our uh, public works uh, director and with his team. Uh, so thank you for what you had to say. You're certainly accurate and true, and uh, again, very professional and a pleasure to deal with. Councilor Franco. So how many miles are done in Groton Long Point annually? Uh, well, it depends which year. Uh, the roads, maybe two, maybe three, and some of the longer ones. Uh, last year with these three roads, probably three quarters of a mile. And. They become flooded down there in Grant Long Plain. Are the majority of the roads down there? Do they become flooded? They become flooded, and you talked earlier about divots, and unfortunately, the freeze and the thaw of the roads and the high water table, we have more repairs and need for um, milling and so forth than the other roads in town. Okay, thank you. Any other counselors have questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you. Next gentlemen, if you could, gentlemen, sorry, if you could also state your um, names for the public, please. Mayor Hedrick, do you want to introduce everybody? Sure. Thanks. I'm Keith Hedrick. I'm the mayor of the city of Groton. Do you have an extra for the minute? Thank you. Jim Albers, public works director, city of Groton. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Tim Albers, public works director, city of Groton. Thank you. All right. Whenever you're ready. Ron Ulos, finance director. So the, the pack that we handed out is just kind of a brief summary. This is more for what we plan on doing in the upcoming year and kind of a history of how we got there. The pages behind it are all of the history of the bond fund from the start in 2013, with the, starting with the Groton Estates and all of the roads that were done in each of the calendar years, up until the very last page, which shows what was done in 2018 and then what the plan is for 2019. In 2018, all the prep work for Benham Road was complete, and the plan was to actually pave Benham Road from uh, Mitchell Street all the way down to Eastern Point. That did not happen, and we'll get into why in a second. Eastern Point Road was paved, and then you'll see there was still some work on the Shore Ave seawall uh, drainage for the engineering study that's being done on that. So that, that's the work that was done from the bond fund in 2018. Going to 2000. In 19, I want to kind of give you a little bit of history with the lots up. In 2016, the city received approval from the town council to reauthorize a portion of the bond proceeds to contract with BL 
to assist with the state of Connecticut lots of application for the reconstruction of Bokwanek Road. That, those costs are part of the, um, the project itself. You have to pay for those, so the council authorizes us to use those for that engineering to get that application done. The, the lots of grant in itself, which we explained at the time, also does not include the engineering for the design work of the project. It only covers the construction admin piece. So we would have to come up with the money for the design engineering work. The funding for the lots ended up being frozen by the state and all projects were put on hold. So last year the decision was made, instead of hedging if the lots was gonna come back or not come back because it was such an unknown, that the city decided that they were gonna pave Benham Road, like I just talked about, from uh, Mitchell all the way to Eastern Point for a price of roughly around 338,000. During 2018, the lots of money came back and was on frozen. So that we had not paved Benham Road at that point. So we put that on hold because we knew that all of our bond fund money would have been used up if we paved Benham. And with the, um, the project coming back on the table, so that would require approximately $220,000 of engineering costs, uh, which, which in turn gets us a grant that we've been committed for a total funding of two point, just, un, just under $2.2 .2 million. So that 200000 when we come to the council in 2016, we explained we actually had the Quantic Road as just a mill and overlay, which is roughly that same amount. So we're actually getting for that same amount of complete re, re, um, full debt proclamation of Bukwanek. So for the 2019, the city's asking to reauthorize the portion of the Benham Road that was approved last year, which um, was the portion from Eastern Point Road to Rainville. We would not pave that, which would free up around $233,000 in order to do the engineering, to cover the engineering costs for Bukwanek Road We'd also like to add Elderkin, which is just under 87,000. And then we have an additional 20,000 remaining for, to complete the Shore Ave seawall, which will use up the city's portion of the bond proceeds in the 2019 calendar year. I'm glad you provided the front page. It made it a little bit easier to follow everything that <laughs> happened with the lots of money. So thank you for doing that. Um, are there questions for Mr. Yoss? Councilor Heath. Uh, the Quantic Road is a disaster, so I'm glad to see that's going to be taken care of. Uh, my question is, are the sidewalks also part of that? Um, Partial. Mm -hmm. there's, forget if there's 1,000 feet or 1,400 feet, will be redone. It's kind of big to choose. It won't be point A to B. Um, but all the catch basins will be rebuilt. They needed all new tops. This will be full depth reclamation. We'll take all the concrete out, um, fix whatever drainage problems we have. Um, we've also been in contact with Eversauce and Frontier and Drop Utilities. Um, so if they have any any inkling of doing anything there, they're working on that right now. And that will be done before we do anything. Sorry, now I misspoke. It's not a disaster. It's just I don't like the sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs> On Paquanic? On Paquanic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Councilor Perry. Is a portion of Paquanic Road outside the city? Yes. It, and are, is that to be repaved in this project as well? No. no. So it stops at the city limits. Where would that stop? Pretty much at under the light. We're, we're Which we're light? The light that goes down? Avenue, the bottom of the hill. Okay. We're at that intersection. We won't be doing the intersection. But we will be going up west and doing all the five corners. That whole intersection will be done at this point. Okay. Tying all the five streets. Any other questions? Councilor Ober. Um, so you're requesting an additional 8,000 to complete the Shore Avenue seawall and drain, draining engineering? Sure. Okay. So, um, John, in our, in our monies, are we in a position where we can do that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Did any of you gentlemen want to add anything else at this point? 
Um, I just wanted to get an update where we are, Mr. Burt, on the highway study. If you could just provide a quick update sure. as to that, and if Mayor Hedrick wants to chime in as well. Sure. Uh, we were just talking about that earlier today. Uh, we received a uh, draft final, which was potentially a final version uh, a little over a week ago. However, uh, Gary and I had some concerns. We had a phone conference, just some changes. We wanted to see some, you know, some mistakes they had in it. Um, but then I've also talked to Mayor Hedrick and they also have some concerns. So we're gonna pull together a joint meeting with, uh, with the representatives from the town and city just to go over, match our notes up and make sure we get all the changes that we need. So I hope it'll be soon, but we're, get, we're getting there. Okay. I just wanna make sure it's done all the way correct. Thank you. Did you wanna add anything, sir? No, that pretty much. No, that, that pretty much covers it. I mean, I talked to John today and, and there's uh, some concerns from both sides regarding some of the information that's in the study. We just want to make sure that it's accurate and it's something that we can live with as a group. Very good. Any other counselors with questions or comments? Councilor Opie. Do we need to do any kind of an action to assure that extra money or do you just do that internally? Do you want to, if you want to recommend a resolution for the, for the 8,000 over? Do you need that tonight? Um, well, I could. What I could do is. No, Mr. Uhas, wanted to speak. John, actually, that eight thousand is still coming from the bond process. Oh, it's still, still not in there. Okay, yeah. so, so we don't need to do anything. What that does so, is by your concurrence, then we'll be all set. I thought you meant by yeah, eight thousand no, above. It's, it's just that we're we're adding additional eight thousand okay. to complete that process. So as long as you concur with the report, we're good. So they're asking us just for consensus to accept the report as submitted tonight. Mm -hmm. Is there any objection to accepting the report as submitted? Okay, you have our consensus. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming out. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we are on to item 5C, 2018-380, knowing school public gardens update on page 22. Um, there isn't really any action required. Did you want to read the introduction, Councilor Atwater? Just the background, please. Uh, the background issued no Ank Public Gardens update. Uh, board members from No Ank Gardens Task Force will be providing a presentation on activities and usage at the No Ank Gardens. No action is required. Thank you. So, um, if there are speakers here, presenters from No Ank Gardens, please come up and introduce yourselves. That would be most helpful. Thank you. Could you please use the microphone, sir? My name is Clint Wright, and I'm the chairman for the Groton Noack Community Gardens uh, and Park Project. Um, I'd like to very briefly. I'm sorry. Could you hold on one minute, please? Working. We can't. We can't hear until. Easy. One moment, please, Mr. Wright. Thank you. I apologize. Okay. All right. We've got a lot of material to cover tonight, so we're going to do a brief introduction. Uh, a few of our task force members are here tonight with us. I'd like to introduce Mike Morell, Tamara Rich, Jen Surf, and of course, Dr. Ray Johnson, who is the co-chair. And I'd like to ask Dr. Johnson to uh, approach the table and can sit with me for the for thank this. you and once again please if you could make sure you're speaking into the microphone because we do have people that are very interested sitting at home watching this and they can't hear unless you use the microphone thank you am i clear you're good yeah, okay. thank you if you could just give them your name please sir my name is dr raymond johnson and i'm the vice chairman of the task force madam mayor Councilors, Mr. Burt, we thank you for the privilege of speaking before you this evening. We understand that there has been some concern raised about the progress that we have been making with the gardens. This evening we have a presentation which has ref reflects a tremendous amount of effort to prepare for this evening, but more important, we hope that by the end of this presentation, you will be aware 
of the strength of our commitment to this endeavor and to bring it to fruition. To do that, we have two main presenters. And you only have to remember one first name because they're both Brian's. Mr. Brian Kent and Mr. Brian Walter. Mr. Kent is a landscape architect and <clears throat> the founding principal of Kent and Frost Landscape Architecture, a designer of many similar parks in our region. Mr. Walter is the global leader of Watson Client Insights and Cognitive Experience for Watson Financial Services Solutions Platform Organization, which IBM introduced in 2016. And Mr. Walter will kick it off. We'll let you know about the agenda they plan to have, and uh, we'll end up with questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Good evening, and thank you for your time. Hello. Uh, I'll come back to the microphone and speak. OK, thanks. As clearly as I can into it in a minute. Great. Um, kind of help everyone follow along. Do you have an extra we for the minutes, please? We have a copy for everyone here at the table. I need, OK. And I'll relay mine for the minutes, then. OK. Thank you. And I do have a spare copy as well. OK. If you have Councillor Bumgardner's, if you could leave it with Mr. Burke, please, and we can make sure he gets it. Yes. Thank you. the next visual. I'm sorry, um, could you repeat that, please? For the AV person in the back, if they could just go to the next slide. Uh, so we're on page number one. In what you have, we've made copies of. I think um, Mr. Greeley has left a remote with you, perhaps? No. Oh, no? Oh, it's a manual? Space bar. Terrific. Self-service. Thank you, Sean. I love it. I love it. So uh, for the next 30 minutes, what we'd like to cover with you is just a brief overview of our accomplishments since we've been in front of you back in, at least myself, September of 2017. Really what our go forward plan is, and Brian Kent will get into the details of that. Uh, I will cover how we plan to manage that, uh, how we plan to cover the accountability of that, and how we plan to manage progress to plan. Uh, and then certainly invite questions from anyone in this room relative to what we've covered today. Relative to what's transpired since September 2017 and today at a high level, uh, obviously we've created a task force. We've built that task force out. Uh, we've established initial growing beds within the gardens. We have set up a memorial within the park. We have planted over 250 evergreens and a dozen fruit trees. And with respect to the garden beds, they have been fully subscribed each year. So we've seen a demand there, uh, and that demand has, um, has been there year in and year out. Uh, our move forward plan is consistent with what we discussed back in 2017 in our framework which is to follow three main themes, and that's recreation, education, and donation. Uh, and within each one of those, we pay particular attention to making sure that we are providing a good balance of service to the community and to its members. 
Now, we expect it to be somewhat of a living document, as we all learn as we progress in this, but certainly think that those are the three core tenets within the program. We're going to page three in the packet that you folks have. Um, the keys to success going forward, I think one of the, the main lessons that we've learned and, and continue to learn is you have to have a shared vision among the task force and among the town council. Going forward, we've got a pick project. We've presented a number of ideas back in 2017. The group has gone over those at length. We've decided on what would be a very uh, compelling anchor project, and, and Brian will present that this evening. Um, once you have a plan for that, you have to have a plan for flawless execution. Uh, and in that, that means that you need to have accountability, transparency, and ownership. At the ownership level, it needs to be owned by experts. You know, it can't be somebody's hobby, it can't be somebody going up a learning curve to do something. They need to have experience in that space. Uh, they need to have done it, uh, and done it a number of times. Um, we need to be able to manage it and report on it. You can't manage what you don't measure, and we intend to share that with the folks in this room on a regular basis so that you feel more informed as to what we're doing, how we're doing it, how we're progressing to plan. Uh, we intend to publish those on a bi-weekly status, use a common format so that everything that's being tracked is tracked in a consistent manner. Uh, and we intend to put together a group of individuals, being no more than three, in order to ensure a swift resolution. That is, if we hit a problem, or we hit something that the task force or the experts cannot resolve or mitigate, uh, those three individuals will have that responsibility. And the reason it's three, it's an odd number. It's a um, uh, pretty strong way to mitigate against getting into a deadlock, um, unless somebody abstains and, and everyone has the buy-in into this project, so that's not expected to happen. What we want to share with you now is what we consider to be our first initiative, the task force has met on this at length. We've had multiple discussions. Brian Kent's going to present it um, against the backdrop of the overall vision, but really drill down into, into phase one of this execution phase. So I'm gonna yield to Brian and let Brian share that with you. Thank you. Did you want to ask questions now, or do you want to hold off until they're done with the presentation? Wait. I'll wait. Okay. So just make a note of your questions. Um, that way, when everyone's finished presenting, then we can go back through everyone. Okay. Hi. Good evening. Thank you. What I am going to do is take you on a tour of the, uh, the concept park master plan that we've put together. Uh, at the task force level with uh, input from some uh, critical uh, stakeholders. And the way I'm going to do this is um, take you through the, the, a little bit of the history of the site and then into what we are proposing. And I want you to remember uh, we have two guiding principles here that has really, uh, I think, underpinned the direction that we're going in. And the first one has been explained to you in some respects by by Brian here relating to the success of the community garden and the garden plots and the, the, the volunteerism and the, and the community connections that that project has engendered. And it has been a, it has been a, a learning experience for everyone and it has been a, a very successful um, uh, endeavor for the, for the neighborhood. Number two is what this park can do for the larger Groton community. And that expands its reach, that expands its value. So beginning with the first slide, this is an aerial view from uh, around uh, uh, 2013 of the school site. You see where the building is and the, and the parking and other uh, um, activities and, and conditions around it. 
this is 2015 during demolition, and, and you know, keep your eye on the area that is, that is being um, uh, demolished. And then here it is, uh, basically in its current condition. So the, the school occupied the center area, is currently an open field. The, the community garden and the garden plots are over here on the, on the far right, on the east side. There's an existing pathway that connects um, the cul-de-sac to uh, Smith Court. And this is the concept plan as it exists today. So you recognize the community garden over on the right, Smith Lane, cul-de-sac, that existing pathway. Those are really the only features of the, of the existing site that, um, that, that would remain in that, in that condition. I'm going to take you through very quickly, uh, beginning down here, and we're going to go clockwise around, uh, around the plant. So in this area is the existing parking area, which will remain. It um, has a capacity of about 30 vehicles, which is, which is a great um, uh, benefit to the overall site in that there is no need for any additional pavement uh, for vehicles. We are terminating, uh, proposing to terminate Smith Lane here. And I'll, I'll take you back if I can, one slide. You see all that paving there, which was driveway to handicapped parking area. That uh, has been re removed in this plant, replaced by a pathway that would connect up to the existing. So you still would have connectivity through the site, which is used by many people in the neighborhood. So zeroing in on this area, what we're proposing is a, a kiosk that gives information on what's going on in the parks, uh, schedule and, and, and uh, events, that sort of thing. There's currently a drainage area here. We propose to uh, landscape it with, uh, with uh, uh, rain garden tolerant plants. <coughs> the kiosk could look something like this. This is a, a uh, information kiosk map that my firm designed for a park in Mansfield, Connecticut. The Raiden Garden could look like this. Currently, we have something similar to this on the site now that's just turf. And what we would propose is to infill it with native plants that can uh, uh, help absorb the, the water that flows in there. <coughs> Next, we're going to talk about uh, the signature project that Brian here is going to follow up with more information on, and that is a pavilion located in the center of the park that would provide a venue for for activities such as um, outdoor classroom, field trips, um, gatherings of that sort. And it could look something like this. This is the pavilion at the Coogan Farm, the Denison Pequot Seapost Nature Center's heritage uh, uh, farm and center uh, in Stonington. Uh, my firm designed this. It was constructed there a couple of years ago. It's 20 feet by 30 feet, and it serves its purpose very well particularly when there are um, uh, uh, field trips and, and organized events where uh, shelter and shade are, 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 uh, are important or even mandatory depending on weather. Currently there is what remains of the school playground. That's uh, what you see here. This is its existing condition. So there's some apparatus that's still in place. Uh, what we propose to do is relocate that playground from where it currently exists into a more centralized location in the park near the pavilion and uh, supplement what's there, uh, the existing equipment, with play apparatus that are mostly made from natural materials. And this is something that uh, the town of Groton does not have, but which is very popular and uh, many communities are looking into uh, uh, implementing these types of natural playgrounds which still provide safe play environments, but allow children to, uh, to uh, develop gross motor uh, skills and strength on natural materials. And with the, uh, the nautical uh, heritage here and the other sorts of, of, uh, of cultural references, we feel like this could be a great uh, amenity and something that uh, the town would be very proud of and that would attract people from across the community. We also um, have looked at this part of the park that uh, joins kind of a natural area of, of uh, trees. It's very shady over there. And what we would like to do there is, is relocate the, uh, the memorial garden 
that's more centered in the park today, uh, where there is a, 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 a granite bench, relocate that onto a new pathway that would run along the tree line uh, where native plants could be featured and where that center area where the uh, playground is now located, that's something of a, a bowl, a healing garden, so to speak, with, with something like a labyrinth, which is used for uh, 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 meditation and thoughtfulness and uh, for many people who are, who are, who are uh, needing uh, 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 relief from the stress of everyday life. Also, we're interested in a pollinator garden in that area, which would be made up of uh, native plants that attract uh, butterflies and other kinds of pollinating uh, insects. Now, the, 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 the largest area of the park would be um, taken up by a sports field. And what we're proposing is a youth lacrosse and soccer field. So this is a full-size field divided in half. So if you were to take the Fitch High School football field and divide it into two smaller fields turned 90 degrees, that's what you would have one of. So that's what this is. This is the size field that the lacrosse and the soccer clubs are using for their youth programs. We've reached out to the Groton Mystic Lacrosse Association and um, they are um, interested in uh, supporting this initiative in any way they can. We've reached out to the Groton Soccer Club. They are also supportive. And we've spoken with the Groton Parks and Recreation Director, Mark Berry, and we have a very strong understanding of what goes into uh, uh, managing a, an athletic field. Uh, the, the Parks and Rec Department would, would schedule the use of the field. They would maintain it. We would work with them to improve the turf, to water the grass. They would, they would line it. And then the, uh, the different organizations would have an additional field in the system uh, to, to have uh, uh, practice and games on. And there is a severe shortage in this town, I'm sure you, you all are aware, of uh, these kinds of fields for the youth programs. Now we're gonna get around to the, the community garden side. Uh, as you know, uh, 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 it's, it's fully subscribed, it has raised beds. Uh, some of the vegetables, some of the produce are given to the giving garden at the Coogan Farm. Others are used by the individuals that subscribe. It's also a venue for community events, block parties, programs and events, uh, field trips. Groups that arrive in buses can, can pull into what was the, the bus uh, drop-off for the school up on William Street. And they can use that pavilion we're also proposing that, um, that a small restroom be developed eventually, and we're locating it uh, where the sewer line that came into the school was located and may still be located. And that is the overall plan for the park. I'm gonna give it back to Brian now. Thank you. So back in your pamphlets, um, there's a there's a bio, and actually there's a bio of each of the individuals that have responsibility for key milestones, and you can take a look at that at your leisure. Um, we're on what's page number seven, which is you know, how we plan to execute on the first initiative, which is the Learning and Recreation Pavilion. So again, our approach will be one of expertise, individual accountability, and, and transparency. Um, for this anchor project, we will start with, as you see in front of you, uh, I like to call the big rock picture, the milestones, you know, which are the elements that have to happen in order for this to succeed, um, the times that they have to happen within, and the sequence that they happen. And if you'll notice, each of the items down below have either an individual owner or a committee, and if it has a committee, those committees are chaired. Um, we will run this with a bi-weekly checkpoint, and I'll share with you what that looks like in a couple of slides. Um, as I said before, we'll have a resolution committee in order to make sure that things don't languish and, and don't fall into prolonged debate. Um, speed matters, 
Uh, I'm sure you'll all agree with that. And, and uh, uh, if you let anything take enough time, eventually it, it, it will languish and, and not go to a great place. Um, phased outline above here, if we turn the page, we'll take a look at what it is, which is the pavilion. And that's on page number eight. And Brian shared that with you. On page number nine, this is our intention on how we approach this and we'll build it. Uh, we have seven milestones or, or kind of big rock approaches. Each one of those has a list of subtasks that go along with those. And if you notice, there's a timeline that goes with that. Uh, and it's the responsibility of each expert owner to vet and validate that timeline, and they'll be responsible for that timeline being met. Uh, we are in a deadline to have those timelines locked down from our end by next week. So each owner will come back and say, yes, we can meet that task that we have ownership of or tasks that we have ownership of by date certain, which is within this particular document here. Um, as we indicated before, we'll provide a bi-weekly update, not only the task force, but make it available to the town council so that you folks can follow along with us. Um, don't be surprised if somewhere along the way there may be an ask or two of you folks. Um, and, uh, and we hope that uh, um, that we'll get your cooperation when it comes to that. Uh, if you go to the next page, page 10, this is what a bi-weekly report will look like. In, in, in my business where I come from, we call it a RAG report. It's red, amber, green. And what it does is it takes each task and it allows you to quickly look at that and say, are we good, green? Are we in danger of slipping the timeline, amber? Are we in trouble, red? If it's amber or if it's red, it goes on a watch list. If it's red, it goes on an action item list, and it's something that will trigger a meeting and a resolution. You'll also notice that there's a percentage completion. Um, so at the, the master task, right, we're tracking a percentage completion, and that will be 100% complete when everything underneath of it is 100%. Uh, so this is kind of a, a to-date report card, if you will. Uh, we've secured the landscape and architect firm, and we just heard from Brian on that. Uh, we've presented our high-level plan to the task force, and the task force is in agreement on that. Uh, we've got a development of the concept plan, which we just looked at. Uh, we've reviewed that with the task force. We've taken revisions to that. Um, so this is probably number three or four turn of the crank on what you're looking at today. Uh, we have preliminary construction costs. Anywhere that, that we're doing something, we are going to look to see where it's been done before, see what we can leverage. In this case, Brian has experience with this particular uh, building, uh, has executed on it, has experience with the vendor, and, and pretty good headlights into what he's got to do to be successful at it, and a good idea of contractors. Um, we have confirmed a fundraising committee that is you know, equipped and ready to stand behind it and execute against the deadline that you see on the prior page. Uh, and it's an aggressive deadline. Um, and we purposely chosen individuals to go after that because to fund something like this is not going to happen through microfunding. It's going to happen through speaking to firms that are willing to write the right size checks in order to meet the deadlines that we have in front of us. Uh, we're pretty confident that we will be able to do that. Um, last two items, obtain required permits, even though we haven't started that. We feel pretty confident that it's something that can get done. It's orange because it hasn't been validated, but we're not going out of the ordinary. We're following a proven path. We're working with uh, an organization that's done it before. And then obviously the start date of construction. Uh, right now we don't have anything standing in front of us that says you cannot start by this date. Um, this is the form of report that will be used for each one of those seven items in that milestone list. Um, it's easy to look at. 
it's easy to digest. I don't have to look at something that has seven different um, formats, seven different ways of categorizing things. Uh, the task force can look at it very quickly, do a very quick scan, understand what needs to be addressed, and focus the energies, time, and attention on addressing those. Uh, next couple pages are bios of folks that you didn't hear from tonight. Um, Charles Lanza, who could not be here. Some of you have met him prior. Uh, Charlie will be leading the public relations side of this. Um, he has extensive experience in that space as you read uh, through his bio. Um, Charlie is a resident of Noank, um, lives over on Prospect Hill Road, very familiar with the, um, the property. Michael Speller, who's part of the fundraising committee um, and has been very involved in his career in projects and programs like this and, and will be a huge asset for us from a fundraising perspective. Uh, from that, uh, I think we've used up our 30 minutes, maybe going over a little bit, and I'm sorry if we did. Um, certainly any questions that, uh, that you folks may have, we'll be more than happy to answer anything that we are not able to answer at this moment. We will certainly commit to come back to you with an answer uh, in a very defined period of time. Well, thank you very much. Um, I know personally, I can't speak for the rest of the council, but I know I've received many um, questions and concerns about the status of the property um, and wondering what is going on with it. Um, curious about what seems to be used the term languishing, um, people expressing concern that the property is indeed languishing. So I'm glad you're here this evening. Um, I will uh, open it up to the council for questions. I have several, but uh, if anyone else has questions that they'd like to start. Councilor Zafiri. Uh, I, I noticed on the uh, program going forward, as you're talking about February, March, April, and July, you're looking to, to be pretty well into this or pretty well, almost through this by the end of the summer, am I, am I correct? Uh, through the pavilion part, yes. And how about the development of the, the, the soccer field and the, the orchard? So each one of those will have it, its own, just as we looked at in here, you know, milestone plan and timeline. Um, we have not sat down and gone through every one of those. I think you know, what we looked at there is um, a great vision. I think everyone has buy into that vision. Um, it's you know, an elephant of a task, and we're pretty familiar with the term, I need an elephant one bite at a time. Um, you know, our first bite into that is the pavilion. Um, that's something we can't answer and put a stamp on when the entire project will be finished. Uh, it is something that we will have to sit down and, and put the same type of group together and put the timeline together. Um, there's two critical dependencies in that. You know, one is obviously getting concurrence agreement and making sure that we're in conformity. The second is making sure that we have the funds to do that. Um, that's a, you know, that is not a cheap or inexpensive effort to build out everything that Brian presented today. What do you, what do you anticipate your expenses will be on this, the cost of this project? So for the, we can speak to the pavilion because okay. we've done our homework on that and, and we see that as a $50,000 expenditure to get that, get that complete and get ribbon cut. Do you anticipate that to be the largest of the expenditures? I don't know. I, I'm looking at Brian. Um, I'm not an expert in, in everything that Brian presented, so I am not the right person to answer that question. Excuse me, could you use a microphone, please? Thank you, sir. The ball field could be more expensive than that, but it will require some, uh, some testing and analysis of the soil conditions. We just don't know what is the condition of the soil. It might just require some fine grading and turf management, and it would be ready to go. Uh, at this point, we don't have that data. Uh, another one uh, would be the playground. 
uh, depending on the, you know, the, the intensity of the equipment and uh, you know, if, whether it's custom made or, or off the shelf and how much kind of volunteer uh, uh, labor we could enlist to help construct it. So there are variables in the, um, in the, in the, in the, the implementation that would allow us to uh, uh, adjust to a budget uh, depending on what's realistic. So we'll gauge our fundraising capabilities and then we'll adjust the, uh, the design so that we can meet our goals for fundraising. Do you anticipate that this will involve a cost to the town? I think our approach at this point is to, uh, is to raise the money uh, ourselves. Uh, but for many of the uh, features of the master plan that I showed you, such as the pollinator garden, the playground, and other parts, there are organizations that fund through grant programs these kinds of community uh, uh, initiatives. So we are definitely looking into the potential for fundraising uh, uh, through grants. Uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, it's a town-owned park. It's an asset to the town. Uh, we would welcome any kind of public funding that's available, but that's not our priority at this point. Our priority is to do, uh, to, to implement the plan uh, ourselves. Councilor Schmidt? Yes, you gave us uh, two bios at the end of the plans. And one is Mr. Lanza, who you identified as the leading public relations side and lives on Prospect and Niantic. Mr. Speller, it does not say what his responsibilities will be for this project. So, Mr. Speller is assisting in the fundraising. Fundraising? Yes, ma'am. And he also lives in Noe? Yes, he does. Thank you. Um, we have Councillor Parker, then Franco, and then Atwater. Right. A couple of things. Um, this summer, I went by the garden and it did not look well attended. So do you guys have a physical group that does this? Because when I went by, it, it did not look attended at all. So if you can speak to that, do you have a group that's working with that? Because I'm just trying to figure out how you have a total of passing out food and it doesn't look like it's been touched. And two, it, the responsibility is going to end up on Parks and Rec. You spoke with Mark Berry about maintaining things. I'm sorry, could you repeat the last? Mark Berry, you said you spoke with him about maintaining certain areas? That was my comment, and that was pertaining to the ball field. If the ball field were to be developed and utilized by local uh, sports clubs, then Parks and Rec maintains all the ball fields in the town on town property that are used by sports clubs and they schedule the use of the fields, they put the lines down for the fields, and they, they mow the grass you know, on a turf management schedule. Just the That's ball field, not the, the rest field. of the property, so who will be maintaining that part of the property? Currently, Parks and Rec mows all of the turf on the park property today, but the other parts of the, of the park are maintained by the volunteers. And how many volunteers are there? Uh, I don't know. I've been there on days where, so I think you early on talked about the being garden. at the park and it not being, the garden. I think, tended. It wasn't well tended. It wasn't well tended at all. So from a, a body count perspective, I've been there when there's been north of 25 folks. They've usually been around days that have been announced in advance and work parties put together. Uh, with respect to individual gardens, those are individual plots, uh, and they're tended to by the individuals that, that rent that space or pay for that space or sponsor that space. Uh, the broader footprint, is done on volunteer work days. And on those volunteer work days, the turnout, as I said, is about 25 or more. Uh, and those folks come with picks and shovels and tractors and mowers and mulch and, and pretty much what they need. Um, you know, admittedly, there's, you know, the main thing you know, that's going on there is, is what was set out 
from the first leg of the stool or early on, which was to get a footprint with some garden in there and to get a, um, get a set of, of trees planted, Christmas trees planted, and Memorial Park. Now, this phase is about now turning it more into uh, a functioning space at a much higher level. Two, two more questions? Okay. Was this supposed to be started back in 2017? Because I know, was it supposed to be started back in 2017? No, what was process? presented in 2017 was a framework to go forward. Okay, because right? we were Back in 2017, um, there was a, a timeline that was coming up. Um, that needed to either get extended or things needed to, you know, basically be wrapped or tended to to hit that timeline and, and shut down or done whatever was going to be done with it. 2017 was an ask for an extension of the timeline of a four year period mm -hmm. to execute against a framework that was provided Th at that time. Okay. Right? Um, I absolutely, if I was sitting next to you, would say, Appears you guys have kind of languished for the last 16 months. Um, and the answer is, could more progress have been made? Absolutely. Um, you know, building things like this, um, it's, it's a big rock to get moving. It takes a lot of energy and resources to get it going. Uh, I sit here very confidently telling you that that rock is rolling and it's moving. Um, you look at the timelines, those timelines you know, speak to this year to get meaningful progress done you know, and concurrent to that other initiatives will happen uh, but really in that period of time i think to me the core tenants that, that needed to get met was uh, sustained buy-in from the task force which uh, was going to be around for the duration right involvement uh, by folks that aren't just interested in in one particular area but the broader area uh, and commitment from folks that have expertise, like the folks in this room here, to apply that expertise, to apply their connections, to apply what they've learned in life, uh, and make this thing a reality, and do it at a low impact, no impact to the group that's sitting up there. Okay. My other question, which you mentioned just schools right now. So this is going to be an open park for everyone, and is this going to be, you're going to have events there you have a facebook page and if the area is for all of the town i think notices should be sent out to let them know that this is going on i don't know how much you guys have done advertising it because i wouldn't have known to go there or anybody from the other side of town i mean they can hear about it tonight but, right but i think more effort should have been taken, like you said, in the last 16 months to get more community outreach. In Agreed, and, and you know, we're kind of victims of our own shortcoming there because we probably would have had a lot more volunteers as well, you know, progressing. Um, I think there's a good platform in place today. Um, it's unfortunate Charlie could not be here. He's probably home watching on TV on the couch. He, uh, had a procedure today, um, but there is uh, a, you know, there's a very concrete vision to be communicated to get people involved. Um, there is a short runway, if you look at your timeline, to actually have a place for people to come to that serves as uh, a learning, education, recreation area, and then plans to progress. So we, we intend to apply the same you know, pressure, if you will, or same execution plan to each of those areas that Brian presented this evening. And I don't think you answered my answer the question about open to the public. It's open, well, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's, it is here for the town of Groton, the town of Noink. It is absolutely for the community. And just the last question, I'm sorry. What do you expect from the town council? I'm gonna to come to each one of you for a donation after tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right now, we do not have a specific ask. 
but that is not to say that we will not have a specific ask. Um, you folks have a lot of experience, you have a lot of knowledge, you certainly have the privilege of seeing uh, what is going on in the town resources. Um, we may run into an issue where we will come back to you and say, we need your help. Uh, as Brian said before, right now, you know, we're looking at this as, as our responsibility to take forward, to secure the funds, to secure the expertise to execute. Um, we do look at it as a partnership, you know, just as much as, as, as we look forward. We may not want to always hear um, you know, your feedback and, and, and whatnot, right? Um, we may ask for participation in certain areas, and, and we'd like to you know, be very candid about that. Right now, there's no ask. Ms. Parker, I think it might be useful to, um, to ask less of what we are going to ask the town council to do. It might be more useful for us to invite the town council to give us input, um, constructive input, as this progress Task. We're inviting the entire town throughout to participate, including the town council, of course. We have Councillor Franco, Atwater, and then Oprey. I have a lot of questions myself. Um, so the two Bryans, Mr. Walter and Mr. Kent, you both live in Groton? Yes. Yes? yes. Okay. Um, I have I did some homework and I went back to some minutes that were back in March of 2017 where I do have a presentation that seems pretty much what you're saying tonight. A lot of things are together in there that you're presenting again tonight. Um, at your minutes from the March 2017 minutes, Miss I, I Brezhnev had came to you with a proper protocol for giving minutes to the town and notifying the town manager of any officer changes. Also, you're supposed to come before the council every January to give written plans for the coming year. Um, twice a year, the garden representatives must report in person to the town council. A quarterly written report must be filed with the town manager. An annual water bill must be paid by the knowing um, garden funds. Um, and you have you know, access to the town grants. So these were some of the things that I noticed. Then I looked at 2018 agenda, and I have three meetings that you've held. Um, July 24th, September 18th, and September 27th. They are agendas, very small agendas. There were no minutes. You have no voting. You had mentioned tonight that Mr. Johnson is on the task force. He is not listed as a member on there. Um, there's no minutes. I know you did hold an event this past, I believe, summer or fall, a pizza party. There's no record of anybody approving the funds to be spent or how, many, how much funds you actually have. Um, so you have talked tonight about transparency and ownership. and. To assist the task force, the proper protocols were given to your group in 2017, and they have not been followed. And when we did speak to you back in November, I believe you came before us in November of 2018, and I said, do you have minutes from your meetings? And you said, oh, well, the last one I haven't gotten to yet. I still don't see them, and I think these are big problems. Um, I had campaigned in 2017 for this position, and I went to thousands of doors, and I will tell you, hundreds of people have complained about this garden. Hundreds, many, multiple hundreds. They've talked to me, they have told me their concerns about it. Um, we have numerous schools that we're trying to offload, and they also want this part, this, what you're calling a park, to also be part of this. And as of where I stand right now, I, so I do agree with them. I'm, I'm not seeing anything that, you have really taken over this and championed it for, the, for yourselves. Um, you haven't, um, there's nothing here. I don't see much. I mean, when I see this back in 2017, this presentation, this is exactly the same page you have in this presentation here. I mean, 
And when I asked you in November of funding and fundraising, you said, oh, well, we have to go get big funding from like Pfizer and, and from Electric Bow. I mean, why haven't you done that already? Because it has to be organized. Um, and you're asking for large amounts of money. You can't do it on the doorstep. You have to think about it. It has to be examined by people who have experience with that sort of thing. Um, and those are the machinations that have been going on for the last couple of years. This is an ad hoc group of laymen um, who are interested in holding that piece of property in the public trust, <coughs> providing garden space for locals, etc. Uh, everybody's got kids, everybody's got jobs, um, and it's difficult sometimes to get a quorum to get somebody to write the minutes, um, and everybody thinks somebody else did it, and, everybody's, and we're kind of frantic. That's why this committee has been formed as a subgroup of the task force. The task force is a governing body of laymen. The committee who's speaking to you tonight is a panel of experienced professionals who have been tasked with this sort of thing in the past and have been successful. It's a, it's an evolutionary process, it's a growing process. Um, it can be difficult to get people to commit because they'll say, well, well what's, your, um, what's your agreement with the town? And we'll say, well, they've, they've given us three more years. And there are very few people who are going to invest 10000 or $20,000 into project that is liable to be extinguished in three more years. People are more apt to participate in, in something like this if they know that they'll be able to take their grandchildren there in 15 years and say, look, this is what we gave that money for. So it's, we're, we're on a precipice, we've been on a precipice since the inception of the project all volunteer. There is no advertising campaign. There's a Facebook page that people who are tuned into Facebook take care of. Um, I have no idea how a Facebook page works. I don't want to know. But part of the evolution was to assemble this group of men who are helping us to find our way through the situations that arrive on a piece of public property to increase the value of it, to enhance the town, um, and make it into a place where people want to move to. They want to move here, buy houses, and bring their kids with them. That's really all we're up to. Councilor Franco, if I may mm -hmm. add something, please. <clears throat> with regard to the minutes, uh, which you expressed concern about in the past, uh, it is our understanding that sometimes the minutes have been forwarded and have not apparently been received from, by our secretary. They've been sent by our secretary and have not been received. And I know from the last time, that the last meeting that we had, they were definitely forwarded. With regard to- May I jump in for a minute, please? Could you please, um, where were they forwarded? To, to whom were they forwarded? Robin. To the town clerk. So the town clerk should have received minutes since 2017 from your organization? Yes. Okay, we can check that, thank you. Yeah. The other thing is with regard to the, the fundraising. We now have a fundraising committee, and Councilor Schmidt asked earlier about Mr. Speller's role. He's chairing that committee. We have seven members on that committee. Uh, the four of us here, uh, Mr. Wright's Life is Robin Thomas and Mr. Speller, who is heading it up, and Mr. Lanza, who is not here this evening. So there's seven of us on that committee. This is the first organized effort to begin to consider fundraising. 
aside from the little things that we've done, uh, trying to get small contributions. And I think that it's important for you to know that Mr. Speller has already drafted a letter uh, for requesting funds that we have all reviewed and that we are prepared to send out to contacts that each of us has, as well as other task force members in their contacts. And so it is the first real effort to raise monies, uh, certainly in the amounts that we were talking about earlier, to make this project uh, worthwhile. And I think that it's readily apparent that none of the, the dream and the vision that has been painted here this evening can be done without money. And until we raise funds, that's not gonna happen. And I think it's important, as Mr. Wright just indicated, that when we go out to raise funds, that the potential donors know that we have a window. And if, if they sense or if they know that we have a limited time frame and we maybe have the rug pulled from under us, they're not likely to contribute. On the other hand, if they know that we have a viable consideration to move on with a project, and they are much more likely to contribute the large amounts of money that we're seeking. $50,000 is no, no chump change, uh, and we will require more for the projects that have been listed as, as on the uh, master plan. So I can tell you this, I've been involved with this project <coughs> since the school was torn down. I was on this, on this we used task force and then on, the, uh, on this force. My enthusiasm for this project has never been as great as it is now. And it is great as it is now because of the work which has gone into coming to this evening presentation, as I said at the outset. But not only from the standpoint of the presentation, but from the standpoint of the vision and the reality of trying to accomplish that vision. So I, I can tell you from my own perspective that I have more optimism than I've ever had. And that doesn't make it happen, obviously. We all have to work together to do that. We have a task force that's very excited about this whole project. They are committed to it. We have the people that have presented this evening who are committed to it. We, ne we never had Mr. Mr. Walter presented in 17. Mr. Kent was not involved with us at that time. What you're seeing here is the talent which we have in the Groton community. And that's why the, the, the thing has been changed from the Noank School of Public Gardens to the Groton Noank Town uh, Community Gardens, Park, Community Park and, and Gardens. So that, in answer to your question, Ms. Ms. Parker, that the whole town would be involved. And we agree with you that we need to promote it. We need to advertise it better. We need to make people aware that it's there so that we can get more enthusiasm within, within, within the entire town. So that's where we stand. Thank you. Um, I, ju I just have to go to back to you, Mr. Wright. You just told me that you're not organized and people are not committed. That is not helping your case whatsoever by stating that to me. What I'm saying is that the task force and the volunteers are comprised of people who are enthusiastic about gardening. That does not qualify each of us as administrators. Um, I just need to stop you right there. I just need to stop you right there. Sure. You are the chairman. You are the administrator, basically. You are the one in charge of this group. Right. And your minutes are not being submitted. Your agendas are not being filled out. You are not letting the public know how much funds you have or who is voting on what or what plans you're doing. Because this is supposed to be on the town website and it's supposed to be made public so the whole town can see what you're doing. And as a transparency, like you had just mentioned, you want to be transparent and have ownership, manage and report and measure progress. You have done none of that last year, nothing. And, it's, it's, and then you just come to me and you simply say, we're not organized and, we're not, and people aren't committed. This is not working well for you right now. I'm just letting you know in my mind. I, I thank you for what you have to say and I understand. I also chair a committee and brand new committee, it's a beautification committee. And we have meetings every two weeks. I have minutes. 
We meet at the library or the senior center. We're committed. We want to make a difference. We want to make a change. Three meetings in a year is not going to make things happen for you at that garden. That's in my perspective. And I think majority of the Groton that have issues with this garden think the same way I do, because I've heard them. They've said these things to me. And I'm speaking right now, at least on their behalf, because they have literally said these things and are very upset about it. Because we have many empty schools, and they can all not become gardens. So you have a million dollar property on your hands, and in the last year, you really haven't done much of anything. You have gardened. You have let people garden. You have planted some trees. And I have also questioned you on that. But also, you, when we asked you about the field, you wanted to put in a ball field, you said, well, it's just for neighborhood kids. It's a pickup. It's not for the town. I mean, but today you're saying something different. But this was just a few months ago in November. Well, so today is a different so story. So down. have you spoken to Mr. Barry since we met in November? Yes. You have. And you have spoken to the ball clubs yes. that are on board that want to help you? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to We have three other councilors right have questions. That's fine. Councilor Atwater and then um, Overy and Baumgartner. Councilor Franco, I hope I can do as well as you do. Um, <clears throat> I, I would like to start off by saying that uh, you're talking about 2017, but actually the, this started four and a half years ago, in October of 2014, when the Knowing School Public Garden Task Force was named the stewards of the property through the guide, a guiding document approved by the town council. Now I'd like to just give you a definition of stewardship. Stewardship is an ethic that embodies the responsible planning and management of resources. And I will have to say that in the last four and a half years, I agree with Councillor Franco, I don't see much of this. Um, the, the guiding document states that you should, you're to provide semi-annual semi reports to the town. There are none. As she mentioned, the minutes, there are none. Um, when you, I think it was October when you were here, not November. Um, we were told that you were supporting the a program called the Food Insecure Families Program through the Coogan Farm, but you couldn't give us any, any idea of, of what was provided. So I'm wondering, can you give me the name of the person, your contact at Coogan Farm, and I can check with them to see how much food was provided? Can you do that now? Craig Floyd. I'm sorry? Craig Floyd. Craig Floyd. Okay. And you also stated when Mayor Granitowski asked you how much was under cultivation, you said two acres. And then you went on to say 750 feet by 330 feet. Well, 750 feet by 330 feet is over five acres. So I went out and I actually measured what was there. And the fenced in area is less than a half an acre. And within that, you've got beds. And I think you gave us a figure of 26 beds and 11 raised beds. Well, when I measured, I found out that the actual amount of cultivation under those beds was 2,000 square feet. And half of it was growing flowers. So I can't imagine how much food was being provided to the, the family insecure fam food insecure families program on a thousand square feet of gardening. And to give you an idea, Peconic Plains sports area is, is uh, I think, about 15 acres. So this area that you're, you're, you have under your stewardship is half that. And the amount of cu cultivation for raising vegetables is less than half the size of this room. I think that's a real waste of, of, of a resource. Um, continuing on. You said that you would seek private and corporate donations. Well, currently, in 2018, you had income of $514. Now, tonight, Brian, um, one of the Bryans, I'm sorry, um, told us that you're fully subscribed 
if you've got 26 beds and 11 raised beds, it's 37, and if you're subscribing those at, at the minimum of $20, sometimes you said 25, that's $740. So how can you be fully subscribed if you only have $514 of income when you should be getting at least 740 In addition to that, you spent $596 on pizza this year. So you have a balance in your account after four and a half years of $2,543.43. This is, I mean, this is ridiculous, the, it, what you're showing us. Anyway, you also said that part of your program was initiation or initiatives with Fitch and Grasso as bringing in students. Um, can you tell me how many students, can you tell me who your contacts are at Fitch and Grasso or any other school as to bringing school children to the program? Yeah, and we're really, we're continuing to work with Ernie Kochmeyer, um, who's in the process of a whole evolving, <coughs> excuse me, evolving program at Fitch and, um, and El Grasso. Uh, and unfortunately, he doesn't get the cooperation he needs to streamline uh, his operations, but he is making progress. Most of the educational involvement that we've had thus far has been with uh, Claude Chester School. And we had um, two classes last year. We have eight classes coming up this year. Um, and the pavilion is key to expanding that program. We can't have kids out in the rain. Okay, let me, let me it was a, sort of a rhetorical question. Let me, let me continue. Mm -hmm. Um, in the presentation tonight, you were, again, were asked by uh, Councillor Sapiri what the big expense was. On your, your uh, diagram here and so forth, you've got restrooms. Restrooms. We, are, I think we carefully but, pointed out that that would be But clearly that that's a, like a huge have. expense compared to anything else. Putting in restrooms is a huge expense. And what bothers me is that four and a half years ago, or four years ago, whatever, the town put in water for you at, at a cost, I understand, of about $10,000. Well, I have a picture here, if I can get my phone to work, of the water line that was put in for you, and it runs underground from a, from a source to an open broken spigot or, or pipe in the ground. So you're not even using the water that, we, that was put in for you four years ago. So, I mean, I will have to say that the only thing I can see that's happened in the last four and a half years is that you've changed your name from the Noank School Public Gardens Task Force um, to the Groton Community Recreation and Garden Facility to the Groton Noank Community Park and Gardens. Um, I mean, this is four and a half years of actually nothing having been done. And I would highly recommend to the council that we put on the, the ballot or the, on the, the, the next town council meeting that we rescind or terminate the agreement that we have under the guiding document. Is that a referral? Yes, a strong referral. Does the public say anything during this meeting? No. no. One moment, please. I need to record. On that rescission, does excuse that mean me, that that land goes up me, for sale? Excuse me, one moment, please. So, um, Mr. Burt, Councilor Atwater is asking for a referral um, to rescind the guiding document for the Noank Garden. Um, might I comment? I have an assessment sheet. Yes. Um, Councillor Franco, the land value is $1,955,800. That's almost $2 million. Okay, Thank so you. we are Thank on you. to Councillor Obrey, Bumgardner, and then Heath. I just, I would really appreciate oh, answering sorry, my yes. question, even if it's I can't sorry, answer that question. question, Mr. Walter. The question, Mr. Atwater, is does that mean on a rescission that land becomes available for sale? Can I purchase that land if I so choose through whatever I, process you I, put forward? I, I'm, not, I'm not questioning the disposition of the land. I'm questioning the stewardship currently of the land. Well, I, then I, I must I have misunderstood what you said, because I'm what sorry. I understood you say is that you 
advise this group to rescind the use of the land as it is now? Yes, to terminate okay. the agreement with, with the Groton Noank Community Park and Gardens okay. Task Force. Thank so you. That, that is, just so you understand the process, that's a referral that will come up at another meeting mm -hmm. where it will be up for discussion. And at that point, then, we can address those questions. But from what I understand you were saying, you're just asking for a termination of the agreement with this particular group? Yes, yes. I, okay. I mean, what happens with the land after that, I'm not discussing at this time. But it'll be open for discussion. It, it'll open be owned by the town. And, it and, and the as town, it is now. It'll be right. right, and the town, to the and the town can decide what terrific. they would like to do with it. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so back to Overy Bum Gardner Heat. Well, they've said a lot of what I had on my mind. Um, I think one of the mistakes with this is the fact that it became like it was an exclusive area. It really, truly was not open to the town. And I think many people felt that. And had it been open more to the town, uh, probably more would have happened. Um, because the more people you have involved, the easier it is to get the expertise that you have now. Um, when you said something about the memorial area in the park to honor community members, my question is, is you have a memorial there. Have you done anything with that? I beg your pardon, I can't hear you. I say we're building it. No, you have a memorial for a teacher yes. on that site. That's correct. That I believe has not been cared for or recognized. Well, I think it has. It uh, has? Yeah, we, we had a, a subcommittee who developed the idea, bought the plants, and put the plants in the ground. Uh, unfortunately, I think about 30% of them didn't survive. Um, they were replaced at our expense again, and I don't know what the status of them is right now. Um, well, there was a tree that was planted and a memorial for a teacher. Well, there's been several trees planted. There's a row of flowering cherry trees going up the Macadam walkway. Those were donated by individuals. There were several peach trees that were donated, uh, excuse me, pear trees <clears throat> that were donated. And this, these are separate from the Memorial Park. The Memorial Park centers around the bench that the children at Noack School bought for the memory of John Turco. Mm -hmm. That bench was removed from the property when the school was demolished. And we were able to retrieve it through communications with the Board of Education. Um, that was the focal point of that small sitting area. <coughs> Subsequent to that, a local family donated a bench in memory of their grandparents, and that bench has been installed there also. Um, I'm sorry, you've got to speak up. I can't hear you. Um, Mr. Greeley, is the are the comments from Mr. Wright being picked up on the video? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, I am so, I so am they're sorry. they're picking it up there, but we're having trouble hearing up here. I see. So okay. if you could I'm speak sorry. up, please. Thank you. Um, just to to briefly reiterate, um, the memorial garden focuses around uh, the memory of one of the former teachers of Noack School. Uh, it was added to by a local family in memory of their uh, antecedents, and it's being developed, or was being developed, as a quiet sitting area. Um, we have decided that it may be a good idea to move the garden. We have professional counsel who has suggested a better area. Um, and I'm in agreement with that. I think most of the task force is in agreement with that. And the one of the reasons for moving it is because of the struggle of getting those plants to take hold. We're, we're, that central part of the property is largely composed of the rubble left behind from a brick and concrete building. 
It's very difficult to grow anything for the first couple of years. Even the weeds wouldn't grow in there. That's okay. Um, um, so it's a process. I think it it's a process. Maybe nice in the in the future that somebody or maybe we'll look into it ourselves to, to re uh, plant a tree that went with that bench originally. I would love to work with you on projects like that. Um, manpower is a very difficult thing to manage. People go up there and I'm not there. I go up there and there's nobody there. It's you know, a, I think that's a thing um, that quite honestly, I think you could probably learn a lot from Riverside Riverview Riverview Thame Street. Uh, Riverfront Children's Center. Yeah, Riverfront Children's Center. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a cooperative uh, you know, spirit that they work with the sub base, they work with the Coast Guard Academy, they work with the local schools, they work with the Rotary, and they've been able to do an enormous amount of things because they're the same situation. They have no, no money, no extra money. And they've reached out to groups but that's why, it, to me, it comes back to the fact that it was like this exclusive situation. I don't expect you probably meant it to be that way, but I think that's the way it has been, has been looked at, which is unfortunate. And I think until, if this goes forward, unless that image is changed, you're not going to get the kind of support that you need to make things really happen. That's my feeling about it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say that, you know, I know that a bathroom would be very expensive, but it's probably the first thing that should be down there. So since there isn't, what do you do? What do you, arrangements do you make? For? Since you don't have a, a bathroom that you've built, what kind of accommodations do you have for the park? We use the rental plastic things that are commonly found on construction sites. Okay, so those are the uh, year-round? No, those we provide for on events. When, I'm sorry? When, when we have events or school groups. So you don't have anything that's there regularly so that people would be able to enjoy that area a little bit more? No, but you can come over to my house. Okay. What's <laughs> that address? Somebody said that to me one time. I went in and took a shower. So be careful. <laughs> Do you have any more questions? Um, no, that's, I think that's the main thing. But I know the family of Mr. Turco's is very upset. And they would really like to know that that bench was there, the tree was there, and the recognition is still there that was meant to go forward when it was donated. Um, but I guess that's my, my um, main things for right now. Okay, we have Councillor Bumgardner, Heed, Granitowski, and back to Franco. All right, good evening, gentlemen. Um, a few quick questions. Um, could you speak to the conversations you had with um, the Department of um, Parks and Recreation regarding the proposed uh, youth in lacrosse field? Yes, I spoke to Mark Berry about how a um, lacrosse soccer field uh, could be um, operated. And um, his remarks had to do with number one, because there is a water source on the site, which the town, I understand now, uh, uh, generously provided, that could be used to, uh, to, to uh, facilitate the establishment of the turf that would be necessary and to keep the turf healthy during, uh, during the summer months. So that's number one. Uh, <coughs> Number two is if, the, if, the, if the, the field is graded correctly and the turf is established and, uh, and the field then can be incorporated into parks and recs uh, system of, uh, of ball fields, they can then begin to schedule it, which would mean that they would um, entertain um, uh, proposals from the different organizations like the the Groton Mystic Lacrosse and the Groton Soccer Club to use the field for, uh, for matches or for practices. And then as Parks and Rec does with all of their other fields on, on town property, they could then uh, schedule the use of the field. And 
there is a shortage of those kinds of fields, and Parks and Rec can, can uh, uh, never provide uh, uh, enough time on their fields as they are uh, uh, requested. So they would welcome uh, the addition of a new field uh, into the system. They would, uh, they would manage the turf by mowing it, fertilizing it, uh, uh, managing the water uh, uh, on the grass, and they would uh, line it with the chalk lining so that when there is a game, the, the, the lines are, are there. For soccer, you have different lines than you have for lacrosse, so that would be something that they could, they could manage. No. Mr. Cubs, I'm sorry, just, mm -hmm. could you just chime in on the funds? You had um, a message. Oh, just to earlier was mentioned about tracking funds. We do track funds, just so the council's aware. So finance has records of all the money? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Councilor Baumgartner. Um, I think many of us on the council share the belief that uh, Groton should be sort of a laboratory for uh, sustainable uh, sustainability initiatives, everything ranging from uh, rain gardens to, uh, you know, really investing in infrastructure that makes our uh, community more resilient to climate change. And um, I saw many of those uh, proposals, uh, I shouldn't say proposals, but uh, ideas within the uh, master plan. Could you uh, speak to that? Um, at all, Brian? Sure. So, you know, one of the principles in developing the plan is to uh, minimize the amount of, of uh, you know, like artificial inputs that would go into the park. And because the, um, the, the initial uh, uh, initiative for the park has been a community garden and, and the production of vegetables, uh, you know, I think everyone has, has come around to the concept that this community park should represent you know, the best kinds of principles in, in landscape management, which do not include chemical fertilizers and do not include exotic plant species uh, and do not include uh, 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 you know, uh, inappropriate use. And so from that standpoint, uh, we've proposed things like a pollinator garden, uh, a rain garden, uh, a native plant walkway. Uh, these are all things that are low maintenance and that benefit our overall environment that complement the uh, mission of the community garden. So generally, it's our approach that this park should be low maintenance, should be uh, as, as environmentally responsible and sustainable as possible. And um, lastly, could you speak to, um, I guess, a, a fear that uh, there may not be, I sh shouldn't say the buy-in, but um, the opportunity for folks who uh, may not be from the neighborhood per se to um, be included in, uh, I shouldn't say included, but um, to partake, partake in uh, the recreational opportunities there, everything ranging from, you know, sledding there or, or um, you know, playing, playing soccer there or um, just kind of um, going into the, the park itself, um, you know, what, what are the things that maybe the task force can do to maybe um, bring folks uh, from outside of um, uh, the uh, co uh, community, in, uh, uh, in, outside of the neighborhood into uh, the planning process? Well, the sports field is probably going to be the largest draw of, uh, you know, outside, uh, the, outside the neighborhood mm -hmm. residents. And that will bring many families as well as the, uh, as the athletes, the children themselves. And one of the considerations in locating, locating the pavilion where we showed on the plan is so that it's adjacent to the field, mm -hmm. so that it can, it can serve as a place where people can watch the games as well. Um, and I will also point out in my conversation with uh, Parks and Rec, we discussed the fact that there are really only two pavilions in the town of Groton that are um, that are rented for events, and they are both in Sutton Park. And we had no decision here. Of course, we're very premature and early in this process, but it did come up that perhaps this pavilion could add to the town's uh, portfolio of, of rental uh, uh, spaces, uh, and that it could bring people in from all over the community that might be interested in renting that pavilion uh, for a family event or for uh, a, a, a group's uh, activity. And with the way that we've designed the park in our plan with the playground uh, and the ball field and, and the other amenities close by, 
It could be a draw for uh, residents from across the town and also generate revenue through the rentals. And then on, on the short term, um, outside of having a, a ball field, um, is there anything that could, any programming that can uh, bring uh, the young folks in, you know, relating to the community garden? Um, the community you know, garden plots are, are open to anyone in, in the town. So they're not limited to uh, the local residents. But the fact of a community garden is, is convenient. So, you know, most of the plots are rented by nearby residents. Uh, not many people want to drive very far or bicycle or however they get around very far to get to a garden. So um, it's self-limiting in, in that respect. But, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to bring more folks from across the community to a really beautiful site uh, that is located near the shore and that has a lot of potential. Um, and, and really, in the southern part of Groton, there, there, are, there are very few community park spaces uh, that are controlled by the town. And so that's um, where we see much of the potential here. Well, I have very deep admiration for your work. Um, I know each and every one of you uh, have put a tremendous amount of time and thought into uh, the park. I think it goes out without saying that many of my colleagues do share uh, or have concerns. Um, I'm of the belief that things, um, especially after reading through this, um, this proposal that, you know, we, you can really make good on, on uh, your promise to, you know, deliver a, a really, I think, cutting edge uh, community space for, for everyone here in Groton. Um, I, you know, I, I would certainly like to see um, the task force, you know, meet some of the um, uh, requests that um, Councillor Franco has illuminated on in terms of um, just being on the ball and, and in terms of submitting uh, meeting minutes and, and that way I think the the council can con collectively uh, you know be uh, assured that you know we're um, you know meeting our that you're meeting your end on the bargain um, that you know we're kind of holding you to so um, I really look forward to seeing this kind of um, develop and um, you know, I, I do have an idea for an anchor project. You know, we're talking a lot about sustainability. And, uh, you know, if you were to have a bathroom, who's to say it couldn't be a, a composting toilet? You know, that way it wouldn't be a major expense to, to the town. And, um, but. And, and that explains why I have been hesitant to, uh, to, to present any numbers on a, on a restroom because it is, is such a variable uh, uh, topic. And we have looked at composting toilets, and we've looked at waterless systems, and we know that a full-fledged restroom is a very expensive item, and we are looking at options to, uh, to, to keep the cost from becoming something that is completely out of scale with the rest of the park. So, you know, we're doing our diligence on that front, but we see that as a later phase. We don't see that as something that can be uh, implemented immediately, so we're, we're, we're choosing our uh, priorities uh, the way we are. Thank you. Okay, we have Councillor Heath, and I had a couple questions, and then Councillor Franco, unless um, Councillor Schmidt wanted in at that point. So, Councillor Heath. Sure. Uh, on page five, you present a, a very, you know, a very extensive, comprehensive plan. Plan. Your you? paper is hitting the microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's a very nice plan. It's got. Uh, soccer field, it's got a playground, it's got healing garden, it's got a uh, pavilion. Um, and then um, also appreciate your timeline. You know, it demonstrates that you've at least thought about, you know, some phases of how to get things done. Um, but I guess a couple of questions. Um, what are the proposed costs for these items? Um, what's What's your timeline for fundraising? What happens if you don't make the fundraising? How much have you raised already? Um, if you could speak to that. Sure. So, um, from a go forward perspective, the first area of focus is the pavilion. And that's what's reflected within this document. Each one of those areas will require the same level of definition 
from a timing, from a costing, from an ownership perspective, and so on. Uh, we're not sitting here saying that that's been completely planned out, nor are we sitting here saying that experts in those areas have been assigned to own each of those areas, um, or funds have been lined up against those. You know, the one thing that's in this document is, is a continual line that shows that fundraising, you know, will go on far beyond a pavilion. Um, but as each of those, as the task force gets together and determines what is the next thing to stand up, if you will, it will have the same associated set of, of you know, people, process, and, um, and execution. It's a big picture. It's, mm -hmm. it's big bucks. That's not going to happen unless great. someone's got a very large checkbook in, in two years. Well, I know like the sports field itself, just to redo our high school sports field, is going to cost $150,000. So I don't know how much well, of we, we have no costs, so. We have no delusions that we're not you know, looking at um, very, very you big know, amount of money. Seven figures when this gets, you know, gets to end, end game. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Right. And it won't get to end game in four years, you know, and um, it's, it's going to be a process that continues to unfold just like anything else. Okay. Uh, um, and that, you know, on fundraising, it, it does pose a interesting question that I certainly can't answer, you know, um, but as people contribute funds to this, um, you will vote. As, as Mr. Atwater introduced, to rescind it, you know, we have to come up with a process to refund people's money um, and a process to notify them that we're up for vote for rescission of intended use, expressed use. So the fundraising will be ongoing. The timeline is unknown that we're all uh, keenly aware of here. Um, it needs to be a process that, that needs to be figured out on um, how you give those funds back um, to individuals um, and do it in a fair and equitable manner. Um, and back to transparency and disclosure, I think, you know, up front we need to go back and revise our fundraising communications to reflect, you know, the feelings that have been expressed here tonight. Sure. Um, well, as a point of reference for fundraising, the uh, is it Anna Bailey Warner House or Bailey Warner House in, in the city? Um, they've been, Mother Bailey, I'm sorry. Uh, they've been attempting to raise money to um, help rehab the house. They need at least 100,000 just to do the basement. They've raised about 10,000. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, it's, a, a very, it's a very big project ahead of you. And I'm not convinced that you really have a plan like you don't seem to have the financing lined up. You don't really have a, you have a plan for what you'd like to spend it on, but now how, not how to get there. Um, and I'd, just I'd to say back it goes on, on for bit. several years um, is questionable, I, concerning. I, I, my pushback on that is, is that there is a very tangible plan for the first phase, and that's to exercise the, um, the relationships that exist among a select group of people that can go and make the proper asks and, and, and ask for the right size of checks. Um, you're not going to microfinance a $50,000 project, nor are you going to microfinance a $50,000 project, $50, project and stand it up by June. You're going to have to go to people that have the wherewithal to cut ten and $15,000 checks, and you're going to have to have the relationships to pick up the phone and call those people and make that ask, ask for that meeting, be able to communicate what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, how it's going to unfold, and, and what life is going to look like at that point in time and afterwards. And that, you know, I'm, I don't have any doubts that that's not in place. Beyond that, if you're going to say to me, you know, where are you going to go unearth a million dollars? You know, there's not a single rock that you turn over to get that. You work with the grant system. You show progress, you build enthusiasm, hopefully you, you know, spiral out your network of folks that have um, the ability to do fundraising. Um, I work very closely with um, 
Salvation Army, their head fundraiser out of Hartford. Um, understand how she goes about her business. She frequents this part of the country um, quite often uh, and does it at a personal level. You know, that is an approach. <coughs> Um, but it'll be a multi-pronged approach without a doubt, and, and there is no silver bullet. And a $120,000 house renovation, you know, hopefully it's demonstrating $120,000 or $121,000 worth of value back to people that are being asked to contribute the money, and you know, they're being told that it's going to be around long after the renovation. All right. Um, well, good luck. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. Um, I guess uh, the other thing I just bring to your attention, um, I haven't been there recently, so you can tell me if I'm wrong, but the last time I was there, um, I was really excited to see the Christmas tree uh, farm that you were setting up, because as a kid, we always went and we got our Christmas trees from Christmas tree farms. Uh, but what struck me is uh, the trees are planted about two feet apart, three feet apart from each other, and the first hit on Google says they need to be planted eight feet apart from each other. So I'm not, I have concerns that you're, you don't only have your financing lined up, you also may not be, whoever's planting the Christmas trees that, you know, they're not even following instructions you can find online. I beg to differ, I pushed the mower through there 40 times. It's two to three feet apart. There might be more. Can you use the microphone? I'm sorry. Um, just by personal experience, um, the trees are, are definitely, um, I think they were, the place that we got the trees from recommended 60 inches. Uh, most of the trees are in excess of 60 inches. Um, the mower deck that I pushed through there time and time again is 42 inches wide. Um, in the very beginning, there were some trees that were too close together and we moved them. So at this point today, uh, even a year and a half ago, um, you can easily push a 42 deck mower through there. Uh, and I'll go with you and push it for you. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, my turn. Um, it's a lovely plan and I wish, I wish it could all happen and be very successful. However, given um, the recent past history, um, you can understand the trepidation that we have as a council. Um, my main concern, um, having visited the garden with Councillor Atwater and Councillor Parker, um, is the lack of garden, if you will. Um, I was very excited to hear that there was going to be a community garden where there would be food donations made to um, local soup kitchens, uh, local pantries, etc. Uh, and I was very disappointed when I saw what was what was there. Um, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm uh, measuring it against a high standard, but um, I know of a place, an urban garden, um, run by a group of women religious um, with much less land than you have access to that donated easily 10 times what could possibly have come out of your garden. Um, and the difference is that they have the reach into the community and they have buy-in from the community and they have an excess of volunteers that are willing to go there and help and invest the hours and invest the time and donate the seeds and you know donate whatever they need to donate to make the garden grow, literally. And they have been very successful. And they have given back to the community many times over. And that's what I wanted for this place. And I'm disappointed that that's not what happened. Um, I'm not sure what the outlook is, but I too had questions similar to Councillor Heed's as far as what's your, what's your deadline for your fundraising? Are you gonna have $50,000 by what date? And if you don't have $50,000, then what's going to happen? Um, if you don't reach that milestone, what happens? If you do reach that milestone, what's the next milestone? And I, I looked at your chart, and I understand you have some things laid out, but it isn't concrete enough for my estimation. I don't know if it is for the others or not. But there still are quite a few questions that remain. 
um, and a good deal of skepticism. So I will leave it at that for now, but my main focus was the, um, the garden itself and, um, and the lack of progress in that area. And it has been a good two years, perhaps five years, if we go back to 2014, that you've had the opportunity to, to make the garden grow. And um, it, it, in my estimation, has not been successful. So that is uh, somewhat disappointing. So appreciate the candor, absolutely share the concerns. Cannot speak to the garden end of it. Um, gentleman to my right hopefully can. On the fundraising, there is a concrete line specific to the pavilion. And if that money's not raised by then, then it should stop. And that date was what? I don't know if the, is, is it the green or the pink? It's the green. So mid-March? Right. So it is March 18th. So you should have $50,000 by March 18th? We should have, we should have our funds, majority of them there by March 18th. And by April 5th, which is the start date of the pavilion, if we don't have 100% funds, we should not be doing that pavilion. So you said 50%, so $25,000 by March 18th? We should have more than that by March 18th. And then 4-5 is the, uh, the drop dead date. If you don't have 50,000 by 4-5. If you don't have it by 4-5, then in my opinion, my candid opinion, it's not gonna come and, and it shouldn't, shouldn't be pursued. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Councilor Franco and then Schmidt. Um, Councilor Zapari. I'd like to ask Mr. Burt if, because I see in the, the I guess, um, some criteria. So if they want to build a structure of such, like a pavilion, restrooms, playground, um, do they have to come to us and ask for our approval for this? Or is this yeah. something that they just have to submit or plans for? Well, I mean, do they have to get the council approval, of course, which is already in the existing agreement? Sorry. But um, yeah, they have, you have to go through all the basic permitting process. So they have to get the town permits, but they yeah. also have to get our permission as well. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. All right. For the current agreement, yes, it requires before building anything having the town council permission. All right. Um, I do think these are very lofty goals that you have. I mean, I think, like you said, it's going to be, it's a million million dollar project over that probably com for a co full completion. Um, um, I just want to actually notate something else again, just because it just popped in front of me again. I believe one of the counselors were asking you a question and you said, oh, well, that's when one of our subcommittees. And then you went on to say what you thought was going on and what was being planted. And what I have to say to you is, this is only based on your memory. The town has no idea what's going on because you're not putting it in writing in any type of minutes. It's your memory that everybody has to rely on. And that means they have to come talk to you. I mean, that's not how this is supposed to work. Um, and I would just like to note to you as well, on these three meetings that you've had, um, when you come to a meeting, usually you approve the minutes from the last meeting. So when you had the these meetings, you weren't, you knew there weren't minutes from the last meeting submitted because nobody approved the previous meeting minutes. So if you have this and there's no meeting minutes in here at all attached to it, you would, I, I don't, you don't, how do you remember what you talked about or what you have on your plan? That's, I just don't understand that. And, and if it's not in there, the town doesn't know as well. So I just wanted to make that notation. So that's a, I'm, I just think it's a very lofty goal and I think it's gonna be very hard to achieve over what I've seen as historical. Councilor Schmidt and then Zapare. 
I had just wanted to uh, let you know that Gosha has put in uh, solar powered bathrooms in at least one of their open space projects. And I'm sure that they would be happy to share that information with you as somebody like Sidney Van Zandt, uh, who's very knowledgeable about those areas. Um, took me through one day and I, we had a walk in the park and it was uh, delightful and they did have bathroom facilities that were solar powered. I don't know the full extent of anything, but it, it seemed like a wonderful idea. Councilor Zapari. I, uh, I appreciate how difficult it is to get a program started. This was a grassroots program without a constitution and without uh, any uh, formal uh, structure as you started uh, this four years ago. So I can see why the progress may have been slow, and I can also understand why there may be some problems with reporting and recording. Um, I like the plan that you have. I, I, I'm a little, one of the things I'm a little skeptical about is it seems like the, you're trying to do an awful lot with a couple of acres, a Christmas tree farm and a, and a rainforest and, a, and, and also have individual plots for people to garden on their own. Uh, I'm, I also have visited the site uh, and I have been disappointed in the poor condition of the gardening plots. It appears that the people who took them did not care for them. And so they took them, they paid their $25, they may have planted some seeds, they walked away and let the weeds take over after that. But that seemed to be what I, what I viewed as I visited. All that being said, uh, it seems like your organization today is better than it was the last time you talked with us. Uh, personally, I would like to see you get until April 5th before we made a decision about breaking our, uh, breaking your holding of the, of the property for your uses. And after, if you don't have the money to go ahead with the first phase of your project, I think that would be the time to, uh, to, uh, cut it loose. Uh, I don't know how many of my fellow councillors will agree with me, but as I said, we have a constitution, we have a town charter, and we have all kinds of things, and we do keep minutes. And at the same time, it seems at this table, it's very disorganized and not in agreement also. So I, I, I can sympathize with your efforts um, and, at the, and the way you're dealing with it. I just hope that you can get it together Get, have meetings and, hold, and give, get meet, minutes to us, uh, disclose your finances, and uh, show that you've made progress toward your goal in the next two months. I don't think that's too much to, to ask uh, of uh, having sat around for four years and waited for something to develop. I think we could, we could sit around for another couple of months and see what you come up with. That's my own feeling. I have to um, insert myself before Councillor Parker goes. I, I disagree with the fact that um, I don't like the comparison. We keep regular minutes. We keep regular order. We hold to certain process, um, and that, that is what ex is expected of us, and that is what is expected of um, the group before us as well. Councillor Parker. The Christmas trees, are you guys selling those? They're not big enough. They're not big enough? No. So the when the trees were given to the garden as a gift. Um, and we planted them because they arrived. And when they were, when they arrived and we planted them, they were about this tall. Uh, it was all volunteer planting and they were pretty haphazardly laid out. Um, they've been since moved around. But I think the, the growing, uh, the lifespan for, or expectation for a Christmas tree is somewhere around seven years. So we're about halfway there. Um, the original plan for the Christmas trees was to donate them to less affluent families who could not afford uh, a Christmas tree. I don't know what Christmas trees cost nowadays, 40 bucks. Um, if you're a single mother, 40 bucks is a lot of money. So I would just assume give them away to people 
who actually have little children who would like to have a tree and can't afford it. Um, the, but we can't do it yet because they're too small. They'll tip over. They're just and little bushies. Does that mean Parks and Rec is watering them? Who's watering them? Does it the mean fire water? company waters them from time to time, and the rest of it, it's rain. Uh, no, Parks and Rec doesn't water up there. There's only one water hose. Um, okay, so you but said the fire department? The fire department has training drills up there, and they'll go up once every, uh, I think they go up there on Monday nights, and they open a hydrant. Um, they don't go up there as much as they used to because they used to use the building as a practice thing. Now there's no building to squirt. So. Okay. Um, Just one last quick question. You could refresh my memory, please. Um, who pays for the water bill? I pay all the bills that come to me. So does the water bill for the, for the water line that was installed by the town, okay. and there is a tap on the premises, if people are using that water to water their garden plots, who's paying for that? Is, is the town paying for that, or is your organization paying for that? I think that NOAC is paying for it. NOAC being fire district? NOAC water. They have a different agreement on their water. I don't, I've, I've talked to the water commission, and I said, you know, how much, what do we got? What are we looking at here? And they said, eh, I don't know. I don't know. Councillor Obrey has input. So I'd, I've never gotten an answer about the water. Okay. I don't, I don't, I'm not down there, but occasionally I have the opportunity to be involved in a sale of a house. And I think you buy your water a little differently in Noank, don't you? Don't you have a flat fee situation for water? Yes. We, we have a flat fee, and it depends on how many faucets you have. In other words, if I had a boat yard and I had 130 faucets, I would pay a different amount than if I had a house with two bathrooms. Uh, if I had a pool, I would pay more. Um, and so, so at this point, the, um, the person that arranges for this, I don't know who it is, but they're accommodating the cost of the water. Excuse me, I'm going to jump in here. Um, the March 2017 minutes say that an annual water bill will be paid from the Noang School Public Garden Funds. Right. Thank you. And the last time I talked to the Water Commission, they go up in October or so and they turn the water off. And I said, okay, so how much, what was it? And he said, oh, we tripped the thing, we zeroed it. What? So they don't know how much the water bill was because they. Oh, well, they probably it do. So you're not paying a water bill. Okay. It's, it's being paid, but it's not being paid by us. And I have a strong feeling that well, you it's just said it was zeroed out. So excuse me. Let, have please a, let him finish his statement. I have a strong feeling that the bill, the annual bill, is probably in the neighborhood of two to three hundred dollars. Um, and that comes from your fund. Yeah, and they they won't they won't charge us for it. Okay, all right. So all, Councillor Heed. One quick request: if you could get us a financial statement, um, just something where you where you started, where you are. The town of Groton maintains that. We okay. ask them for that information when we need it. Sure. Um, okay. Madam Mayor. <coughs> Yes, Doctor. Um, may I make a statement about the fundraising? Yes. It's readily apparent this evening, I think, that the council still has tremendous concern about this property. Uh, as a member of the fundraising committee, I personally would have serious concerns about going out tonight and asking people for money. I appreciate Councilor Superior's statement uh, about waiting until April. But I think given all the comments which have been made, almost uniformly there has been serious concern and doubt about where this project is going. And I personally would have difficulty calling anybody that, with whom I have contact tomorrow and say, would you be willing to donate $10,000? When it seems almost imminent that the project may be terminated. And so I, I think realistically speaking, it's very difficult 
for me personally, and I, and I take responsibility for my own statement, for my own feelings, whether the other fundraising committee members feel the same way or not, that I would have difficulty sleeping at night, asking people for money, when I know where the sentiment lies right now. And until I was more firmly convinced that there was some change in mind with regard to the town council, which I don't see or hear tonight, I couldn't do that. So, um, Mr. Burt, is there the possibility um, that funds could be placed in an escrow account? That if people donated, they could hold the money there or just not cash the checks until the time? Or I'm not sure how this could be worked. I'm, I'm sure we could do it in escrow. Can we, was, why don't we bring Cindy up here since she's our financial And expert. while we're doing that, did, speak. Yeah. Right, thank yeah. you. Um, we're lucky that Director Landry is here. She's going to want to move. She's hurting. <laughs> Dr. Johnson, could you um, let her? Oh, she's going to come over here. Thank you. I, just to respond, I, I don't really think it's fair to put the onus back on us. We're challenging you. Our job is to hold your feet to the fire. You're in, um, you're um, not in charge of, but you're, uh, you've got a public trust. You're in stewards of a, of a public property. And our job is to vigorously challenge you. Um, and you've already spoken about the need to raise money and that you have a, a letter that you have uh, prepared and you know who you need to, vaguely speaking, um, like where you need to go to get the money. Um, and you also have, a, or you're thinking about a process of how to get the money back to people if you have to return it to them. So I would say that you've got a short period of time to prove yourselves. Uh, so I wouldn't, I don't think it's fair to, to put it on us. It's, it's all on you. Uh, so I would challenge you to make it happen. Mr. Burt? Yeah, there'd be no problem with us, with us taking the money. We're, that's what we're doing now for them. You just want it clearly designated for this, you know, not spending the money until you know for sure what's going forward and so it could easily be reimbursed. So they could fundraise, accept donations, turn them over to the town. If the goal was not met, the town would turn the money back over to the individuals who contributed? Right. Does that make sense? It makes me feel much more comfortable. Okay. <laughs> That's our outwater. Um, I'd just like to comment that Council Zapiri said that if we waited four years, we could wait two more months. If we're going to have this on the Council meeting in, in uh, I think it's March 5th, that's another two weeks. Um, if you waited four years to raise this money, can't you wait two more weeks before you raise money? And then if you have to push the date from April 5th to April 19th, um, I, I just don't see where this is a big issue. We're gonna make a decision in a couple of weeks, I hope. And, and I don't think you're gonna raise the $50,000 in the next two weeks, so I just. Well, I think it's probably won't, so. Saying in two weeks your decision is you. made and it's a it's fait accompli, then I completely agree with you. Yeah, I, I mean, is, isn't that what we're. Um, yeah. Mr. Burt, what was the date when um, it would be the referral would be coming to us? Would it be the first cow on, in March? I, I would go ahead and put it on because of the time you had put it on next week's cow. It has to go through a cow first and the then 26th. to the And then it would go for, then you would recommend on which action you want to take for the March 5th council meeting. So that's where March 5th comes from. The final action would be March 5th. Okay, so it'll be fitted into the cow for next week with potential action for the 5th of right. March. Right. Does that make sense? Right. Okay. All right. Councilors of Perry. Is there any reason why it must be in next week? Is there any reason why we can't put it off until no. April? No, whatever the council wishes. <laughs> okay. Doesn't matter to me. Okay, everyone has had a chance to speak uh, more than once, um, and we are at 9.20. So um, if there's no further discussion at this point, I'm going to call for a recess for five minutes. And thank you, gentlemen, uh, for coming out this evening. We appreciate your time. We thank you. you. We thank you, Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we are recessing. At 15, 919. 919. Atwater or Councillor Schmidt? No, I, I read the. Uh, so, Councillor Schmidt. Schmidt. 
Um, on page 23, no action is required, but if you just want to do a little bit of the reading uh, as the background for the public, please. Right. The uh, Town Council is considering a local vendor bid preference as a tool for supporting local businesses. And for the initial discussions, the following purchasing staff recommendations will be discussed. And did you want to go over these individually, or do you want me to present them to the... Can I would... Can I just make one comment? Yes. Um, I'm going to put this. Basically, it doesn't mean that they're uh, in favor or against uh, purchasing policy. Just if we, um, this is purchasing, if you were to do one, here's the parameters I would recommend. Okay. Doing. So just to set the framework for it. Okay. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. Very good. So I think that... All right. Thank you, Councilor Schmidt. So uh, we have with us Mr. Schneider, Ms. Landry, and Ms. Cardillo. Yes. yes. Um, and I don't know who wants to start. I'll start. Mm, excuse I, me. I went through um, the public bids that I did from August through December, which is a total of 39 of them. And there was only one Groton um, bidder in all of those uh, bids that I did. So I just wanted to let you know that. And I believe that that document, um, John, was shared with the, the council yeah, as well. At one point, yeah. So um, the, one of the concerns that we need to think about is um, you know, being competitive and, and having vendors want to participate in our bids going forward and not feel that you know, they may not have a chance because of um, you know, a local vendor preference. That's, you know, something that I just want to bring up, that it, it could limit competition, which would eventually may raise prices for the town if we don't have the level, level of competition that we currently get. And I'm all for, um, you know, any vendor that wants to participate, local or non-local, to continue to feel that, you know, it's fair and um, you know the playing ground is fair on, on all levels. I don't know if you wanted to bring up the last time that this was um, brought in front of the council, I think it was um, it was brought before the council, I believe, in 2010 and 2011. And at that time, kind of the same concerns that Eileen is talking about now: the lack of um, lack of competition, the um, towns that do have it. Um, said that, that they didn't really see a need for it. Um, but at that time, the council did vote not to move forward with it. Um, Eileen had done some research, and she just has a, um, she wanted to just go over a couple of other um, advantages and disadvantages to it, to whether we were to implement such a program. I also wanted to uh, say that back in 2010 and 11, there seemed to be um, some discussion about whether it required an ordinance or if it could just be an amendment to the purchasing manual. So that's something else we'd have to consider. Um, should we move forward with this? Mr. Schneider, did you want to add anything? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gary, so didn't mean Gary, to startle you. <laughs> no, Gary has the construction contract, so he has like different issues than we would have on right. on on our our level here. Right. Certainly, there there are advantages. Um, you know, achieving local social policy goals to assist local the local economy improving and protecting the local economy by expanding and uh, the expansion and retention of the local business community, thereby keeping tax dollars spent on contracts within the area. Um, however, as I mentioned, you know, um, increased cost is one of the disadvantages that could happen for us to implement a program, uh, limiting supplier competition, which could drive up the cost. Uh, reducing the incentive for local businesses to provide the best value for dollar for the purchased goods and services, uh, affecting, complicating, and potentially burdening the procurement administrative process because there is an administrative process that would have to be implemented as well. You have to um, ensure that the vendors are actually rotten based vendors and uh, that they're, you know, up to date on their taxes, that they have a lease that you can, you know, validate. This has to happen every single time you do a public bid mm -hmm. in this process. Um, you know, lack, uh, lacking equal, equal opportunity for other vendors. Um, like I said before, 
we may get less competition because of this if we do do it. And um, lastly, I'd like to mention that the National Institute of Governmental Purchasing, also known as NIGP, uh, does not support um, the local vendor preferences because uh, their feeling is that it conflicts with the fundamental public procurement principles uh, of imp impartiality and full and open competition. Thank you. I just had a quick question here before we open it for discussion. On your um, bullet number five, where it says the following, following would be exempt from local vendor preference mm -hmm. policy, state of Connecticut contract, cooperative purchasing agreement, and purchases involving federal mm -hmm. or state grants. What percent of your total purchases do you think that is then? So how much would be excluded from this policy? Mm -hmm. Just ballpark. Um, so all our, the school projects would be excluded. Mm -hmm. It's. It's hard to say because it depends on the commodity that we buy, and it has to be over $15,000. So if the purchase is under that, um, it wouldn't you know, qualify for this program anyways. We look to uh, use state contracts and cooperative purchasing because the bidding process has already happened, and it's, we can just piggyback off those agreements. So we have, um, so, so as I was saying, this, the school projects would be exempt. Um, well, if you buy fuel from a cooperative, which we used to do, I don't know if we still buy we, fuel. We, we still, still do, do that but would the, be exempt. the school projects are going out to bid. Right. Uh, Gary can speak to that. And uh, the purchasing department does the goods and services. The construction projects are bid through the uh, uh, Department of Public Works following the purchasing manual. Uh, the purchase orders are cut by the purchasing uh, agent. Uh, she takes a look at all, all, all the stuff she has the, after the award is uh, uh, given. What we're looking on the construction contract side is, is several things. There's two types. There's a lump sum, which is what came before the council before. It's a lump sum. I'll do the project for $15,000, $16,000. Or we have a unit price where there may be one to 100 or 200 specific items. If you are constructing a sewer or a road, there will be a number of, there will be an estimate of 450 cubic yards of gravel the contractor will put his price in, the installation of sidewalk, concrete. So all of these items are, are, are there for the contractor to put his full price to do that portion of work into it. And what the 2011 memo that uh, I had written for the town manager back then is that we need to be careful on on, if there's a policy that the council wants us to follow, we need to have, um, I, I was going to say, good rules and regulations on how we're going to apply this. As I said, for the school contracts, that was simple. That's state money. The state says, says really, thou shall use low bidder, period. There's some exceptions with the WBEs, MBEs, the, the set-asides, but it is low bidder, period. Federal contracts are the same, any portion of that. I don't know, maybe even using some of our low sub funds, we would have to, if the council had a local bidder preference, we would have to go back to the state because that's using state funds that they do give to us. So one of the things is that most of our construction projects, there are some, there's a mix, there are local, and the, but the state or federal grants usually are very strict and it shall be, you know, qualified low bidder. Uh, and as I said before, if the council does put a, a policy together uh, or would like staff would then determines that the, this is the way they want to go. We, we, would, um, we would need to look internally and with, I think, some advice from the town attorney on how to move. To award a contract usually takes us 60 days. I notify the apparent low bidder. Then we do all the qualifications. Do they have the bonds? Do they have the insurance? Are the qualifications there? References are checked and everything else. If, if I have, if, there is a local, if the local vendor preference is there within a certain percentage, uh, you know, do I do that for both other contractors? The, the apparent low bidder and the local, uh, local low bidder? Uh, or do I just go with the one that we will take a look at, uh, qualify that person? Does the preferred local vendor have five days to make a decision? Because I have 60 days to, about award, of a, to award a contract can't eat up a lot of that time. So there'll be a lot of steps that we'll need to do to uh, put together so it is very clear to all of the bidders you know, of, of how this is going to be treated. But to, to answer the mayor's question, the federal and the state grants are, 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 they, are, they are uh, 
it states that it's the low bidder uh, uh, that, that has awarded the project. Councillor Heed and then Zapir. Uh, thank you for looking into that and providing some pros and cons. I would never have thought that having a, um, what is it, a local bid break policy would lead to higher prices or less competition. It never occurred to me. Um, so thank you for looking into that. Um, so Gary got into it, but what are some of the things, like it seems to me like, is it our policy that we always take the lowest bid anyways, or I, I seem to recall, maybe it was on the city council, um, that sometimes the low bid comes in, but you know it's, it's from a, a source that you know, isn't necessarily as reputable as the one that's maybe a little bit higher. So do we have flexibility to choose between that, is it, or is it always lowest bid? It's, it's not always the lowest bidder, it's the lowest qualified bidder. So if there are, are bidders that are not equal, like they're offering what they consider to be an equal product, but yet we know that this product is uh, deficient in some way, we can award to a bidder that is not below bid, but we have to have just cause. There is, in per, uh, public procurement, there are two types of awards that you can do. I'm not talking about federal funds. Um, low bid or evaluated bid. And an evaluated bid, you have select criteria that you're judging and evaluating and, and, and measuring this vendor's proposal. Those are the only two that are allowed in public procurement. But um, the lowest qualified bidder when it's low bid is what you award to. So, you know, we um, just did a bid recently for uh, chemicals for the uh, water department. And um, the low bidder that came in, his product didn't meet our specifications. So they were, you know, rejected. And then you go to the next low bid and you compare your specifications to what um, you received in the bid. And if it meets the specifications, then you award to that bidder. Or you keep going up <laughs> or down the road um, until you find exactly what you went out to bid for. And, and that's where you award it. So you could actually award to a higher bidder for that reason. Evaluate it the same way. You, you know, you measure people's proposals on their on the criteria, and uh, the ones that have the highest rating are the ones that would be awarded the bid. All right. Thank you. Councilor Zapir, and then that one. I don't know if we use them, but there are our systems in place for <coughs> preference for minority bidders. Uh, do we have any preferences for any specific types of groups? I, I know Gary does on a lot of the construction projects because they're through state funds. Uh, we don't have a particular minority policy, procurement policy here. In, when you're doing state projects, do you have to use uh, minority uh, preference? Uh, on the school projects, definitely. On some of the wastewater projects, the clean water funds, absolutely. Uh, we had, there was that MBE, WBE, uh, low sub funds, which come from the state, you know, our state grants from the st state grants from the state. The uh, grants from the state down to the local governments here, there is no requirement for M M MWB, you know, WBEs. So the larger grants, the state grants use the clean water funds, which are federal dollars too, or, or any of the federal stuff, which, and the school systems, and the school projects require a certain percentage of MWB, but the rest of, uh, if we had local funding for a contract, for a sidewalk replacement or something else, there is no requirement. Um, now, with, the, with the, your experience with these uh, biddings that you take where you give preference to minority groups, do you find that interferes with the quality of the bidding that you get? Uh, no, no, there's uh, uh, several of the sidewalk contractors that we had that were low bid. Uh, there was not a requirement that they were MW, you know, M, M, uh, minority or woman owned business. Yeah. Uh, they, were, they were on the list, they were, they were qualified low bidders. They could do the work, they, they submitted a low bid, they just happened to also have the, that category too, and it's usually some of the concrete work. 
that is done, okay. some of the drive it work, uh, the exterior of the building constructions, uh, those are usually those, uh, those groups, and they do very well with, with, with a good bid. Well, the only thing I'm, I'm thinking is that you do have you do have selected groups of people based on criteria other than just their low bid, and you've gotten along with that without being anti-competitive or without having uh, a poorer product produced for the town. Uh, could that also e extend to uh, local contractors? Uh, a, a new criteria for a, a, a special group that needs attention from us and that would be local contractors. I guess, I guess we could, definitely. Um, could you repeat that? What? Could you repeat that question again, please? <laughs> well, I'm just observing that we, we are already dealing with stepping outside the realm of being purely preserving competition because we're purely taking the low bidder. But in doing that, we have experience in which we don't purely take the low bidder. We purely prefer either minority contractors or women-owned businesses uh, over uh, the run-of-the-mill contractors. So we are giving preference to certain groups already, and, we, and in doing that, we have not seen a deterioration in the product that we're getting or the, co or the cost, I presume. So why can't we extend another group to another group to recognize another group that deserves our special attention, and that would be contractors who are primarily located in the town of Groton. Councilor Atwater? I mean, any 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 response? Oh, uh, uh, as long as uh, to me, if that's the council's policy, and we and we and the council sets policy, and that's the policy, uh, staff will have to work through some of the um, the procedures for that. Uh, the policy would be, I don't know if it would be to match the low bid. If you're five percent over, or are we going to go with a low bidder? The low bidder can be five percent more. Some of the concerns I have is five percent. Five percent of ten thousand dollars isn't much. Five percent of five hundred thousand dollar contract. I'm asking the second low, the local preferred bid, the local bidder, that if he can sharpen his pencil for twenty-five, thirty, or forty thousand dollars below the price that he said was his price to do the work. My concern when the numbers get that high, it's gonna come from one of three areas. One is he's gonna pay his people less. He's going to give me an inferior product uh, because he's not gonna buy it up this table with a certain specifications. As Eileen has said, you're gonna get something that barely meets this or barely doesn't meet the specifications. Or the third thing is he's gonna change order us to death. And I've had contractors do that, that if it isn't specifically in the you know contract and if uh, there that he'd say that's a change condition and he'll be putting change order after change order in to try to you know make his money back up yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. So there has to be something set there. You know wh what are we talking about? Five percent of five hundred thousand dollars, which is twenty five thousand, if I'm correct. You know that's a that's a chunk of money to come out of anyone's bid, especially when they're supposed to sharpen their pencil. Or is it five percent up to a certain point? So it's if the council sets the policy, then it's how uh, how we uh, what, what's the parameters. And what's the expectations? Uh, will the preferred, well, the local bidder? You know, he, I, I would say the one recommendation, if that's the case, we would notify them, but they have five days to make that decision. And we, we can't sit there and yeah. 10 days, 15, right, right. 20 days out because now the project is just moving on and I don't want to lose the low bidder. What I don't want to do is if the local person says, no, I've looked at it, I can't do it. I need to go back to the low bidder and I don't want that low bidder to say, I. I've already bid on other stuff, I got other work. And now we're going to the third little bidder. So there has to be a, a time period in there where the reaction needs to be, the actions need, need to be done fairly quickly so we can determine who the, you know, that, that low bidder is if the, when the policy is, if the policy is set up. Can I also um, add that um, when we talk about the women and minority based and, and 
this is just a thought in my that I was thinking about. We're not limiting that is not limited as much as a local vendor because with the local vendor you make your pool is much smaller but for the women or minority owned that could be a much larger pool within the whole entire state so by limiting to a just to say that that by giving preference to women and minority owned when we say only for the local we're only talking about Groton vendors which is going to be a much smaller pool of vendors even available to bid not, on our jobs. Yeah, I don't think we would be getting uh, bids from only from local bidders. We'd oh. be putting the, the bid out statewide or right. however you usually put them out. But if a local bidder puts in, mm -hmm. if a Groton company puts in a bid uh, that's only 5% off of, uh, of a low bid, it, would it be, would we suffer that much in loss of competition? Mm -hmm by having this policy, since we have already have experience with giving preferential treatment to other groups that are defined by either a racial issue or defined by a gender issue, and now we want to define it by a location issue. And uh, we have put in other criteria, we put in additional criteria We've had experience with those restrictive criteria, and it hasn't hurt our our uh, uh, what we purchased, as I as I'm understanding it now. Um, so uh, I don't see that this is that much of a difference. Mr. Burt wanted to add something at this point. Yeah, kind of jumping on partly of what Gary was saying a minute ago. Um, if the council wanted to move forward, we would just want some broad, the broad parameters, like what's on this bullet list. We would go back, work with the attorneys on what the process would be. We would lay, you know, there's a lot of questions that would have to be answered. It would probably be a couple months of going through things. And then we would bring a product back to you for review and could make changes from there. Uh, I would want to, you know, really look at, though, making sure it's not onerous. And, you know, I'm not really, I, I don't worry too. I've, I've, my last community had a 5% bid break. What I did see, I did see, I only saw it come, in 11 years, I saw it come into play and swing things to the local vendor like three times in 11 years. But two of the times involved the same two companies on uh, purchasing vehicles for the police department, and there was really only two sources, and the other one quit, the outside one quit bidding after that, just he couldn't beat it. There were too close of margins on those, so, that, you know, that can happen. Um, but it's still nice to go local. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure that I hold thing is just make sure it's not onerous on the staff. We'd have to really look at it, and a lot of it would be dictated by those parameters you give us. Um, and I, I do worry about Gary's thing about if you have too large a margin. Construction, you know, I, I've had those, you know, vendors, I've worked with two in construction, that nickel and diamond, you know, maybe 499,000 is too high an amount. You know, something like, something like what we had with the, uh, the entranceway at the part four, you know, that's a small project, you're probably not getting into a lot, you know, that's you know one that could have swung the other way. Though keep in mind the other bidder was North Stonington. They could have at least local you know employees here. You know so that you know if there's that you know if they're close by you know that you know comes into play too. But um, but so you know focus you know yeah you know, like I said you know if you get a broad primer, so you generally want to go with then we'll look it up. But I just want to make sure whatever we do is not onerous. And I don't know I'd like to know how many bids. Would we really have over the course of a year that would fall between fifteen thousand and four ninety nine? If you took a guess, how many would you mm -hmm. think you total per year? Yeah, so, it's not totaled though. Yeah, but well, this went back to August of seventeen, right? August of seventeen through yeah. December of eighteen. Mm -hmm. And out of thirty nine, you had only one, one Groton vendor that even um, issued a bid. Because I think. Um, in the minutes from 10 and 11, I think that was another issue they found. We just, there are just not a lot of Groton vendors that um, even bid on our, they just can't bid on what we're asking for. Sure. Okay, Councilor Atwater and then Councilor Baumgartner and Obrey. Um, was was the, the 39, was that from this last August till current? It was August. 2017 through December 2018. So it was fiscal year 18 and part of fiscal year 19. Okay, so so roughly 35, 40 a year of which you had one. Um, I mean, I understand we want to promote local business and so forth, but I think for the 
all of the other problems that go with it, we're, we're being a disservice to the taxpayer if we're going to have prices go up or if we have to pay someone extra time to manage it and so forth. I mean, it, to me, it almost seems like a, a moot point that, that we shouldn't even be spending our time this evening talking about it. And I would like to comment to, to Councilor Safiri, and I don't know, but some of these other mandates like minorities and women, I don't think those are things that this council voted on. I think those are things that are sort of put on us by other outside sources or whatever, so. Councilor Baumgartner, right. then over in Franco. I know uh, much of the discussion has centered around the actual vendors, so the folks who um, would own a business that, um, you know, would, that would be domiciled here in, in town. Um, could you speak to um, how, you know, when we go out to bid, uh, you know, put out the RFP, when we issue that bid, is there any language in uh, that bid dealing with the actual uh, wages, so uh, dealing with the potential for wage theft? Um, so, say if there's a, you know, an, an employee uh, working for that company that uh, there is, you know, will require of them the proper documentation that, uh, you know, will require that they provide, um, you know, certified payroll, uh, uh, payroll slips uh, to, um, you know, whomever would ask for them, um, and among other um, things, just to protect those folks who, you know, certainly live in town. Um, you know, they're obviously being paid a prevailing wage, but um, to ensure that, you know, the, those dollars that uh, rightfully go to the, those folks, and many of them, you know, ideally would be living in Grodd, uh, would be, be, you know, that they're pair their, their fair share. Any of our uh, contracts uh, that have those, uh, uh, have to have a, the wage limits, uh, the, uh, the state wage limits are, before we make payment, they're certified payrolls that we require from the contractor. The architect or the engineer looks at it, we keep them filed here. The previous school project, when we built three schools, the Department of Labor was down several times to take a look at that, and they didn't, and if I, my memory serves me right, I didn't, uh, they did not find any, any, uh, any of those issues where a person was supposed to be paid a carpenter and he's been paid a labor. But we require those certified payrolls where the contractor is certifying. We've also had, Department of Labor come down and question us on some other smaller projects and then, and then go back to the contractor. So we are very cognizant on that. Some of our smaller projects, which are just a lump sum, it's like 20 days worth of work or something else that doesn't have certified payrolls, uh, that's, uh, that's between the contractor and the, and the person that works for them. But those larger projects, all certified payrolls, they're kept on a file, they're reviewed, and for the state uh, board of ed project, or the state project with the school projects, they come down and look at that periodically, that the people are paid the, white, the proper wage uh, for the work that they're doing. Now, vendors coming, we, we don't require anything, I don't think, for it. There's guide, definite guidelines based on the type of job, if it's rehab, if it's 100,000, and if it's brand new construction, it's up to a million now. Really? Yeah. Okay. It was 400,000 and it went up to a million. <laughs> so there are guidelines for whether prevailing wages take effect or not, mm -hmm. based on the contract. So are, are the bidders required to provide the uh, information to uh, the town when they, uh, when we go up, uh, when we issue that RFP, um, when they uh, send back that RFP, are they required to uh, say whether or not they violated um, you know, wage theft uh, laws and, and our, you know, uh, statues within the state, um, and, well, you know, we say within the last five, ten years. Right. I mean, one is, the first thing we check is if they've been debarred, there's a state has a yes. list of debarred, con mm -hmm. that's the first thing we check. Mm -hmm. So if, if they have done any of that stuff, they're on the list, they're debarred, so we, we cannot, we will not, cannot, will not award to them. Mm -hmm. uh, all of our contracts, notify right up front in the specifications this is a you know the, the estimate is over a hundred thousand dollars or for new work over the old number was 400 it could be a million now this is the estimate the wage rates this is where to get them you're expected to pay this is a wage rate so we notify the general contractor the person who's going to bid on it what his response what their responsibilities are 
Uh, so if the, if the limit was $100,000 for renovation and they come in at $98,000, then, then it's not a wage rate project. Uh, but if it, they come in at over $100,000, then it is. They, they provide those wage rates. We insert those wage rates into their contract. So we have all, all that there. Uh, it's been good. We've had, again, as I said before, some people come down from the Department of Labor to investigate our records and then talk to the contractor. But we've been very clear and upfront of, of what the requirements are and, and checking those debar lists uh, or the list from the state. Thank you. Councilor Oberry and then Franco. Um, the thing that uh, comes to mind with me is the period of time that you're talking about. Um, we have a lot of companies that went out of business, uh, a lot of contractors, and I'm beginning to see them come back a little bit. I mean, we don't have builders like we used to have, you know, larger building companies here. There's a lot of different trades that are, we just don't have here like we used to have. So I think we'd mainly be talking about small business. I don't think it would be anything that was very large from what we have here now. I think we have maybe two that actually have, you know, a good amount of employees and trucks and et cetera. So I don't think it would be anything. And, you know, maybe we could come up with a number that, that keeps it to a small entities and mm -hmm. help those people to maybe get a little bit stronger and grow a little bit more. Uh, I really, I, you know, I know uh, what builders and contractors have gone through in this area. Uh, you know, and it, most of them have uh, not ever gotten to the point where they could rebuild. And so my thought with this originally was to mainly help small business, not big ones. So if we limited the number on the bid that we were working with, then I think we might be able to draw in more people from Groton. Um, I just, um, I just think it's, it, it probably would be a lot of work for you. To me, I see it as a very small way of trying to help people in Groton. And uh, so I still, I hope we can go forward and look at this a little bit more. Franco. How long do you think it would take to, I mean, you're talking a couple months before you can come back with some type of answer and go through every regulation that you have and every ordinance and statutes or whatever. Go through attorneys and go back and forth and questions that have to be answered. All these things always take that long. Yeah, yeah so my question is like how, how much would it cost the town basically to do this whole changeover possibly? Like you're looking at man hours, attorney hours. I was just curious. Hard to tell the man hours. There are a lot of questions with this. I don't think it'd be a ton of attorney fees. You know, a few hundred dollars maybe. And the attorney fees maybe a little more. But it'd be a bit of staff time to go through all this. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's where the real cost is. And then the I, what I would say is don't have us go through that unless you're pretty sure you want to go through it. That's what I'm asking. Right. You know, because that's a, it is a lot of work for the staff. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we've had one in a year and a half, and were they within the five percent? It was the type bid that it was. It was a a rate based bid, giving us um, you know their hourly rates and then percentage over uh, cost for parts. Uh, I would have to go back and and just. You know, review it, and I could I could get back to you with an answer. And you're, if it was. this is up to December 2018, is what you're saying? Your records? Yeah. So this isn't anything in the current year? No. Okay. Um, so you're not actually sure if they were in that 5% you'd look? I don't want to, you know, um, do a misstatement here. No, so I understand. I could, I could go back and check it. And so we're not even sure if they were in the 5%. Right. So, okay. Thank you. So... We need to give some guidance um, to staff as to whether we want them to pursue this or not. So I'm hearing from Councillor Obrey that she would like the um, bid range to be lower. So dropped from 499 to what number would you think? 
or do you want that to be something that they will consider? Do yeah, the rest I, of I you would let somebody else set that number? Okay. Um, Councillor Heed has not spoken on this yet. Go ahead. I have actually. Oh, you have? I'm sorry. Has anyone else who hasn't spoken yet want to speak first? Go ahead. Um, I'm inclined to say don't do it, but at the same time, the reason why I would be inclined to say we should have some kind of a policy is in the last bid that just came through, um, the local guy missed by a dollar. Um, I know, don't know anything about the company from outside of town, but it, it just seems to me that that close of a, a bid, not 25000 but $1, uh, just, you know, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. So. Um, but I'd be very concerned that we not create a situation where we then drive people out of competing. I guess I would say maybe if we could request some time to come back to the council that we can analyze the bids over the last few years a little better and maybe if we can narrow the range down and see what you know would be maybe help, not too onerous but helpful maybe to the local vendors potentially and, and not to you know if we could just have a little more time to look at it before you give any broad parameters. I would like the, um, the memo from that came from Public Works in I think 2010 or 2011. I was trying to bring it up on an iPad and I can't open it here. It here but those yeah. those items, if we could re mm -hmm. revisit those mm -hmm. items and see if they're still pertinent, please. Mm -hmm. So is that acceptable to everyone if the, if we give them some time to go back and look at things, explore it a little bit further, and come back to us? Any objection to that? As long as we put them early. The agenda. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Early in the agenda. Um, can I? I just wanted yes. to clarify one thing that um, Leanne, you were saying. Our minimum bid threshold is fifteen thousand dollars for something to go to bid. Were you looking? I, I think the max is more. What were you talking is about? Is that? That's what I assume. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, so we don't get up to that four ninety nine. So, is there any objection to having them? look into it a little bit further and come back to us with more information. Yeah, Councilor Franco. I just have one quick question. So when if it comes to a public works bid, so if you send something out for bid, are we talking all the subcontractors inside that the bid? Or are we just talking the main bid? That's <laughs> part of the policy. That was what it, some of yeah, the things what, that are in the so, memo from 2010. And it's that, lump sum or unit price, and and that's, that's, that's the memo. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. that so I would like everybody to that's, take a look at that again and make yeah. sure we're not going to cause too much um, yeah. pressure on staff for this. But maybe we could. It is a it. noble cause. Maybe we could do it after tax time. After tax time. Well, I mean, I know how busy everybody's going to be. Oh, I see what you're saying. Months, I thought so. you meant just to entertain the policies. Okay. No. All right. <laughs> that would be, that's fine. Is that acceptable to everyone if it waits till after budget is done for them to look into this? That's fine. Mm -hmm. Any objection to that? That's fine. That's Does great. that help a little bit? Great. Yeah. Cindy, right. if you want to go out and do it tonight, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> okay. So um, we've given our direction to the manager. We're on to item 5B, however, it is 1010. I am um, required to ask if you wish to continue. We have one item left on the agenda. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't thank you for coming out and for waiting so patiently. Um, we have one item left on the agenda, and then there are a couple things that need to be taken care of under other business. Um, is it acceptable to the council to proceed with the agenda? Yes. Any objection? No. Okay. So. Um, Councillors of Perry, we are on 5E. You're in the minority. Um, 2018 424-2 Sister Cities on page 24, please. Motion to recommend a resolution that the Town Council authorizes the Town Manager to send a letter of invitation via Congressman Joe Courtney to Haifa, Israel and to Kingston, Jamaica to become Sister Cities with the Town of Groton. I so move. Second. Moved by Sapari and seconded by Baumgartner. Um, I, I would like to make an amendment to this, please. I move. Um, the only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to strike via Congressman Joe Courtney and insert via the respective consulates in Boston. I'll second. Uh, hold on. Let me write. <coughs> So I'll read the whole thing as, as I would like it to be amended. 
motion is to recommend a, uh, to recommend a motion that the town council authorizes the town manager to send a letter of invitation via the respective consulates in Boston to Haifa, Israel, and Kingston, Jamaica, to become sister cities with the town of Groton, is what I moved and what Councillor Heath seconded. Is there a discussion on the amendment? I heard Councillor Schmidt ask a question. Do they both have consulates in uh, Boston? I'm not sure. I assume right. so. Yes. I was counseled. Jamaica. Uh, yes. Councillor Baumgartner says yes. Okay. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Okay, so we will vote on the amendment first, and then if the amendment fails, it goes back to the original. If the amendment passes, then we vote on the whole amended motion. So all and, those... And discussion will be when? Well, right now is discussion on the amendment. Do you I have don't discussion have a on the amendment? the amendment. Okay. So that's what's on the floor right now. So we vote the amendment up or down, and then we go back to the whole motion and we vote on the whole motion as amended. Or if the amendment or fails, we vote on... Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So... All those in favor of the amendment as read a minute ago, say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? Okay, so the opposed was Councillor Obert. Okay, so the motion as, that's on the floor now for discussion is um, sending the letter via the town manager to the consulates in Boston. We're open for discussion on the amendment. Councillor Obert. My only concern, and I guess I have to take some of the blame myself because I just haven't had the opportunity, but I'm still concerned as to what this really means. What obligations does the town have? What costs do the town have? I don't feel we have enough information. I'm not adverse to it. I think it could be very interesting and very rewarding, but we have no idea what we're really committing ourselves to. And so consequently, I couldn't vote in favor of it, even though I think it could be a wonderful opportunity. And I know, so, uh, Conrad, I think it was, you sent me something that if I went to it, I'd see the cost, but thank you, but I haven't gotten there. But I, I, I think that the cost and the commitment needs to be a discussion of this council before we move forward. Councilor Heath, Bum Gardner, Franco. Actually, um, I reached out to Scott Bates, uh, Port Authority, um, to get the uh, information on, on Sister Cities. Actually, I looked at the website, then I called him, and he gave me the name of somebody who, to your point, I have not even had time to, to call him back during like waking hours. Uh, so I haven't spoken to him yet either, but he's, um, Scott Bates and this other gentleman are on the board of Sister Cities. Uh, which meets in, it's an organization in Washington, D.C., um, and they don't seem to have any objection to it. I wanted to speak to them at length and get a little bit more information. Um, so, but that being said, this is just seeing if the cities would even be interested. Uh, and I, I have no real objection with at least beginning the process of reaching out to the cities. My concern is, is this where we start, or should we have started with reaching out to the sister cities organization in D.C.? So, you know, I, I, I intend on voting for it tonight because I don't see any reason to stop it. Um, but I think we should consider, are there other uh, options that we should be looking at other cities? Uh, are there better ways to do this to make it happen? Because, you know, um, I think it's a, a great opportunity in theory. I just. I haven't really participated in it myself, so that's all I have to say about that. Councillor Baumgartner? I, um, I too share some of my concerns that um, Councillor uh, Heed raises. Um, I would also say that, you know, we should have somewhat of a contingency plan in the case that, um, you know, if you're listening Haifa, you know, Haifa and, and Kingston, um, it, you know, our relationship doesn't work out, you know, I'm hopeful that Maybe, you know, maybe a relationship with, um, you know, another community will. So, um, you know, there are a lot of different municipalities throughout uh, the entire world that I think have done a lot of really cool and innovative things in their communities that maybe Groton wants to learn from. And I think we've done some pretty cool things over the last several hundred years here in town that, you know, they could try to learn from us, but maybe not so much given, uh, you know, some uh, uh, obvious, uh, national security um, 
you know, uh, you know re relating to the subs and whatnot. But uh, nonetheless, um, you know, I, I think it's great that we're doing this, and I'm, I'm hopeful we could, you know, maybe, um, you know, cooper uh, co collaborate with uh, this organization in D.C. to learn more about kind of what the, um, kind of the uh, typical process would be to engage these communities. I mean, it's, we're dealing with consulates and embassies, so um, I think some clarity there and, and certainly engaging, I think, the folks who have been involved with this and kind of creating it, this framework for our sister, uh, proposed sister city relationship with uh, Haifa and Kingston is probably the most paramount of importance because if we're to engage with them in this official ca uh, capacity, um, I think it, you know, there's clearly some asks uh, and some ideas about, you know, um, in engaging our, their, um, you know, uh, universities overseas and, um, you know, cooperation on logistics hubs. Uh, it's kind of big stuff. So I think kind of having an un understanding of what, um, you know, we need to do on our end is, is important. So I'm excited about it. I think even if this doesn't necessarily work out uh, as it's spelled out on this paper, I think they're, it's a good, um, you know, starting point. So um, I'll leave it at that. Councilor Franco. I think you just said everything I was going to, so I think I'm all set. Councilor Zafari. He said everything I was going to say. As this is just like a starting point, just to see if they're interested. Thank you. Councilor Zafari. I like the semantics of sister city because uh, it's a fraternal relationship and when it severs it doesn't need a divorce <laughs> children simply grow up and leave the house i mean as long as there is a relationship that's worth preserving if there's a cultural exchange if there is a uh, any kind of even a commercial relationship that develops with businesses between in the two communities, that's great. Um, but it is reaching out and recognizing our relationship with other communities, and uh, we don't have any major commitment. We don't have to go to court for a divorce. Uh, it's not a marriage. So I, I think the upside is is pretty high. And the downside, I don't think there is a downside. Uh, but whatever. I'm going to jump in because you went once already. Um, okay, go ahead before you forget. Councilor Heath, <laughs> <Councilor laughs> <Heath, laughs> go ahead and let you talk. <laughs> go ahead, go for it. Oh my God. Um, I think that. Having been involved in something similar to this years back, you invite somebody to be part of this, but then you need somebody that's going to take this over and run with it. And in my involvement before was because the Chamber of Commerce stepped in and took it over, because there was a lot that had to be done once it started. Um, and as you say, it just ended. Uh, but in the interim, there was arrangements that had to be made when they decided to come as to where they were going to stay, who was going to pay for it, who was going to feed them, who was going to take them around to local entities that we wanted to introduce them to. It's a big project if it works out. And I don't think we're even thinking about that. I don't think the council wants to take on doing that. So you'd have to reach out to somebody to get somebody that's going to work with you on this to go forward. You just you're all you're just being a little naive about this. Usually we have somebody sitting here giving us guidance, and when we don't have any, and and as I say, I'm just we were very fortunate before because the council did, uh, the chamber did really step forward and do all the work. And we did have a lot of people that donated a lot of different things. But again, it, that's coordination. And I, I don't think the town manager and our, anybody that works for the town is in a position to take that over. And I don't think we're going to take it over. So I, I, I we, the, uh, pardon me? Councilor Smith. Really well said. Thank you. <laughs> um, my con my concern. Um, is I, I can 
support the way this is written this evening. However, um, my concern is that this did not originate from this council. Um, this, this was a request from someone else. And I don't feel like it necessarily represents where we would choose to go if we wanted to pursue this relationship on our own. Um, having said that, I am of the mind of Councilor Baumgartner and Councilor Heed that if we go ahead and we send this, we make this overture to the consulates, um, we should still consider pursuing a sister city of our choice, oh, wow. something that would be appealing and matching our desires, something that um, someone in the community could champion. Um, so that's, that's my thoughts on this at this point. Um, and I don't know who else wants to speak right now. So I think we've got, who hasn't spoken? Atwater hasn't spoken. Baumgartner wants to talk again. Do you want to speak before Councilor Baumgartner? I want to move the question. You want to move the question? Oh, I shouldn't have yielded oh, to you. Oh, 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 can't move the question. Oh, you can't move the question. <laughs> committee of the whole said the rules chair. <laughs> Councilor Baumgartner. <You're> here. <laughs> it's in our rules. It's in, it's actually not our oh, okay. rules. <laughs> Councilor Baumgartner. I'll be brief, Councilor Atwater. <laughs> Um, but um, it, it may be a good opportunity to uh, reach out to uh, Fitch High School, the IB program. Um, I know they spend a lot of time uh, studying the world, so perhaps they could find a, a community that is kind of in line with our values and similar uh, demographically. Um, so just a thought. There's a, there's a world of potential out there. Okay, Councilor Franco. So, Mr. Burt, you had said if they accept there's a lot of negotiation that's being done and what we would want to be doing. But you'd also, you had stated there would be committee, a committee formed, right? And they would be the ones. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah you could do it. You could have the cham Chamber of Commerce do it, but if we're gonna become sister cities, we would have to have somebody at the table. But yeah, you form a committee to negotiate and see if it goes anywhere. And you could always drop it if it doesn't, if you can't come to an agreement. Okay, so. thank you. All right. I think everyone's spoken. No further discussion. So we are voting on the amended resolution. Do I need to read it again or are we set? Are we good? So all those in favor of the amended resolution, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. I will go without two. Okay. Hold on, please. So favor? I'm not, no, I'm not opposed. I know. I'm oh, getting I, the. I thought you were saying. No, I'm getting in favor of Zapari. That's my face up. Can can we do the opposed again so I can get the others, please? So okay, Atwater is in favor. Heat is in favor. Yes, ma'am. Franco is in favor. Yes. Baumgartner. Yes. You guys. Opposed. Schmidt. <laughs> you never want to end. Obrey. Granatowski. <laughs> so it's five to three to zero. We need five to pass. That's the rules chair. Or six, five, correct? Majority. Majority of councilors present? Correct. Okay, very good. Okay, we are under, we are on to, excuse me, that was my paper. Um, we are on to review of agenda items. I don't believe we have anything else, but we do have other business. And I have something for other business. I'd like to make a referral to the February 26th cow. Um, in order to create mission, uh, let's see, how do I want to say this? Referral to the cow to consider creating the Grattan Resilience and Sustainability Task Force for February 26, 2019 cow. Can you give me a little flexibility in that just in case, because I'm out for surgery tomorrow and the packet has to go out. Thursday, I want to right. make sure there's time to get it in there for. Right. Which is <laughs> so, so there's a chance it could be pushed to March. That's, if that's fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's to create a new task force on resilience and sustainability. Any other other business? We need to make a referral. Go ahead. It's a referral to the rules committee. Uh, just we have a couple little edits we need to make. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. We need to edit a couple of things. Uh, well, to be specific, um, we need to uh, change the rules that it says um, you recess 
like during the budget season, you recess to the next meeting instead of adjourning. I mean, it's just simple stuff. So it's adjusting language in the rules, Correct. so you're referring, making a referral to yourself. Right. Okay, excellent. And there was another hand, I thought. Two more hands. Who was first? Councilor Baumgartner. Um, See, somebody else forgot. <laughs> so, um, just a, qu a quick um, comment. Um, I think that's great. So, the sustainability uh, task force. Um, I was reading in the paper uh, the city of Norwich, I, I believe, is commissioning a study on uh, the operation, their fire department operations. Um, I know Norwich has a, a, a number of fire departments. Um, some of them are, um, I believe, uh, actually one of them is a paid fire department. I think the rest of them are all volunteer. Um, so in some ways it mirrors um, you know, Grot Groton's um, situation. Um, in many ways our demographics mirror uh, Norwich's situation, uh, maybe not to the, the um, you know, um, to a certain extent, but uh, nonetheless, I, I think it's something we should look at. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm ready to do a referral on it, but I hope we can maybe talk about that at some point, um, just to kind of maybe take a look at the way we do fire uh, here in, in Groton. Um, and um, I would like to um, make a formal referral uh, regarding um, uh, it, um, basically wage theft. I brought it up tonight, but um, I think it's especially important when we're uh, talking about uh, the labor uh, that will be needed to build our schools um, and really ensuring that um, our, uh, you know, the workers for the school projects are be paying their, really their fair share uh, as kind of outlined um, in, you know, in, in contracts. So that they're essentially contract compliance and, um, you know, especially with our desire that um, you know, we utilize a, a large um, local uh, labor pool that you know folks here will be you know getting the the profits that, that not the profit but the um, you know the the money that they've worked so hard for and will be spending here and you know contributing back into our um, revenue streams in the form of property taxes and whatnot that um, you know they get pay their fair share. So, right. yeah. did you want to I'm say not, something? I'm not sure what else we could be doing that we're not already planning though. I, 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 I guess I, I need to know the point of the referral in terms of what would staff bring to the table on that. And Arcadis did that paper earlier, you know, about processes and I think they covered some of that and I'd have to relook at it. But so, we, I mean, we take it very seriously and we're doing all the best practices for it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's more, you're more reiterating that let's make sure we follow the best practices. So unless you have something specific different in mind that we're not doing, I don't know of any, I don't think Gary has anything else to try. So yeah, so taking a look at our, mm -hmm. our purchasing manual, mm -hmm. but uh, codifying within mm -hmm. um, the or our ordinance is a, a commitment to it. Um, so sort of every bid out there, not just the ones that require it for state bids, for all bids? Correct. We'll have to add a staff person yeah. to do that. We'll have to have on staff. That's not something we can do with current staff. We'll talk offline. Yeah. 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 All right, so did you want the referral or do you want to hold off? I'll hold off on it, but um, okay. I will, I'll, we'll definitely have a discussion. Okay. Have some of my thoughts on it. All right, sounds good. Thank you. No problem. Councilor Franco. Uh, there was some discussion about the North Starrington Bridge recently. It was brought up, I know, at the RTM. And can you reiterate, Mr. Burt, um, has the state reinstated any of yes. the funding? Yes, they have. There's, I think uh, their portion would be 600000 and then the other 600000 would be split between uh, Stonington and Groton if we were to move forward with it. And I did see uh, Rob Simmons at that <coughs> lieutenant governor meeting, and he said they, uh, they do still have the money for their portion. <laughs> However, just to your aware, because of where our budget is, I, I'm not initially recommending it. I think we have to have some discussions on hard decisions, and the council could always add it back in, but I'm not anticipating my initial CIP will likely have it. Okay. Anybody else? Councilor Zaperi? Motion to adjourn. Second. Moved by Zaperi, seconded by Heed. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. So moved unanimously. We are adjourned at 10 30.